Hello, good morning everybody, and we are gonna reconvene our budget hearings uh, from this week, and today is June 18th, 2019. Uh, today is our Health uh, and Human Services Day, and uh, I'll begin with item number 25, which is a presentation on the Health and Human Services budget category as provided in the proposed budget, pages 145 to 147, and outlined in a memorandum of the CIO. Sorry. Any Good morning. Over here? Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Members of the board, Christina yes. Mowry, the county budget manager. I'll be providing you an overview of the health and human services category. Great. So here you can see the departments that make up our health and human services category, everything from child support, our core investments, human services, health services, and our homeless services coordination. The health and human services category expenditures are approximately 340 million for the upcoming fiscal year. This represents 41% of all the budget expenditures for fiscal year 1920 and is a 5% increase from the previous fiscal year, which is the increased cost to maintain current operations and the development or expansion of some programs, including drug medical, IHSS, whole person care and increased support for homeless services. This chart shows the share of expenditures by department and agency. And you can see there that uh, health and human services make up the majority. For fiscal year 1920, the largest expenditure is of course salaries and benefits, which comprises 158 million of the total and supports uh, 1,153 and a half positions, an increase of 32 uh, plus positions from the previous fiscal year primarily adding about 25 positions mid-year for the whole person care and fit program. Additional expenditures include services and supplies of 99 million, other charges of 85 million, and other financing <coughs> except the remainder of the expenditures at 15 million. Fiscal year 2021 estimated expenditures are anticipated to increase by 2.4 million or 1% and will be updated as more information is known. The health and human services category includes $308 million in revenues this year, or 91% of their total financing, um, and other <coughs> funds make up the difference, or 9%, uh, to meet the necessary expenditures. These revenues represent 40% of the total budgeted revenues. This chart shows the share of financing by department and agency, and note that core investments are not represented as they are totally supported by the general fund. The 2019-20 revenues are comprised of $214 million in intergovernmental revenues, $52 million comes from charges for services, $25 million in other financing, and $17 million in other revenues, including the use of money in taxes and licenses and permits. Additional financing includes $31 million from the general fund contribution and less than a million dollars in other funds. Fiscal year 2021 estimated revenues are status quo at this time and will be updated the following year when more information is known. So this chart shows the departmental and agency share of funding supported by the general fund uh, for a total of $31 million, which represents about 19 million, 19% uh, excuse me, of the total general fund net cost. Further details will be provided in each budget proposal. And this will give you a few uh, highlights of the operational plan for the next two years. The Health and Human Services Departments uh, contributed 47 objectives to the 1921 operational plan. Uh, major projects include reducing clinic wait times, increasing access to withdrawal management services, doubling the number of low-income families participating in Thrive by Three, and an initiative to increase the number of individuals experiencing homelessness moving into permanent housing. Critical unmet needs in the health and human services arena remain, including the navigation center to provide services for the homeless population. Expanded behavioral health services supports to our aging population and permanent supportive housing needs. <coughs> However, we would like to leave you with just a few of the accomplishments health and human services um, had this year. Clinics um, have gone through extensive remodel um, and have added uh, various uh, exam rooms and completed a remodel at the Watsonville Health Center and at the Emmeline Clinic. 
uh, drug medical uh, program continues to expand capacity and over the next two years this program will double the number of withdrawal management service days which is currently the largest obstacles to clients entering treatment. Adult Protective Services um, has added a long term care management team called Transforming Lives with Care. Housing uh, received an additional $3 million to support low income individuals and families to obtain and maintain uh, permanent housing. Employment and Training, um, Human Services expanded the CalFresh Employment and Training Services through a partnership with Downtown Streets team to provide job readiness and work experience in the city of Santa Cruz. Along, also along the coast in uh, North Santa Cruz and in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, Thrive by Three investments um, continue to improve coordination and increase capacity of home visiting programs. And all four home visiting programs experienced increases in enrollments and wait lists for these services declined by 85%. So the majority of our health and human services budgets will provide more information on the regular agenda today. Uh, child support is listed on the consent agenda as a status quo budget proposal. And Jamie Murray, our uh, department head, is here today if you have any questions. Great. Are there any questions from board members? We'll get into more detail later with the, with the next items. Okay, seeing none. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to us about uh, what you just heard, item number 25? Seeing none. Uh, we'll move back uh, to our agenda, which is item number 26, which is action on the consent agenda. This is item 31. Uh, this is the um, uh, homeless services no. coordinate, or sorry. It's the Department of Child Support. Department of, yes, the Department of uh, Child Support Services uh, outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule continuing agreement list items for the final day on last budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as recommended by the CAO. Uh, first, is there any public comment? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding the Human Services Department, uh, my empirical... Well, on this is we're talking about the Department of Child Support Services. Oh, okay, my bad. Any other comment? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for I action. I would move the consent agenda. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your work. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to item number 27, which is to consider the 2019-2021 proposed budgets for the Homeless Services Coordination Office as outlined in a referenced budget documents and recommended by the CAO. Ms. Marr and Ms. Benson, thank you for coming today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. I'm Rainey Marr, the county's Homeless Services Coordinator, and with me this morning is Elisa Benson, our Assistant County Administrative Officer, who has been working extensively with me on this issue. You might want to um, get closer to the microphone. Yeah, sorry, my chair won't let me move any further <laughs> forward. <laughs> Mine's low and hers is high. The, the arms are like such that I can't Here. get any, oh, there we okay. go. Now I can move closer, thank you. <laughs> Um, before I begin my presentation, I would like to extend my immense appreciation to your board, to our county administrative officer and our, and our CAO's office, and to our county departments, our many um, nonprofit providers, faith community, and local jurisdictions for their very excellent work on this issue, for their partnership and their support in our collective work on addressing the issue of homelessness in our community. This morning, I'm going to provide you with an overview of the various elements of coordination our office is leading, some key accomplishments from the past year, the proposed budget, and some key areas where our work in the coming year will be focused. I will also provide you with a brief update on the state's proposal for homelessness funding and on the 2019 point in time count. The role of this office has been very systems level, engaging with the many key people and organizations working on this issue, to collaborate on implementing service improvements and expansion, to bring new resources to bear, and to drive systems change. All with the ultimate goals of reducing homelessness and assisting our unsheltered residents to return to permanent housing. 
This past year marked a significant expansion of work for this office. Our team worked internally with county departments to implement smart path coordinated entry intake and assessment processes in departments serving homeless individuals and families. And I would mention that this was with the key partnership of the Human Services Department. Um, we worked with the Homeless Action Partnership and the Human Services Department to plan for the transition of the smart path lead agency from Homeless Services Center where it was um, germinated um, to the Human Services Department where it is thriving at this point. Um, the transition took effect October 1st, 2018. Um, we also worked with the Homeless Action Partnership to establish new sustainable sources of funding for Smart Path and that included uh, applying to HUD for an expansion grant for coordinated entry and implementing new uh, user participation fees for HMIS. We worked with the South County Homeless Steering Committee and the City of Watsonville and the Salvation Army and were able to launch the new South County Navigation Center down there. What opened in August was a day services program and then in November the winter shelter program came online and through the HEAP funding we've been able to extend that program so that it will now be 365 days a year um, of services and uh, day and night. So they'll be now providing day services seven days a week and shelter overnight. And this is a key accomplishment of uh, the, for the all-in plan with regard to South County. So our, we're very proud of that work. Um, worked with the Homeless Action Partnership, the City of Santa Cruz, and numerous partners to expand sheltering in North County. I'm sure you're aware of all the very many contracts that have come before your board for sheltering at River Street, Laurel Street, VFW. Uh, we initiated a comprehensive homeless services investments analysis and baseline systems assessment through a contract with Focus Strategies. And the goal here is to develop a data-driven crisis response system that aligns our resources more effectively. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later in my presentation. Um, we worked with the Homeless Action Partnership and local jurisdictions to plan for and apply for the Homeless Emergency Aid Program and the California Emergency Solutions and Housing Grant Programs, bringing in $10.6 million for our community. And we um, embedded in that work was a significant amount of community planning. We had extensive community meetings, um, South County, Mid County, North County, to establish the priorities for that funding. And then we oversaw the um, process for the RFP, a development of the RFP, the selection process, and now we're managing the work of um, implementing all of those contracts. Through, uh, though these were some of the key accomplishments, the proposed budget document contains more detail on the fiscal year 2018-19 goals and accomplishments. Since the establishment of this office in fiscal year 15-16, there's been a steady expansion of our total bed nights of emergency shelter. And I say bed nights because in some cases we haven't been able to expand the number of beds, but we've been able to extend the number of nights for which services are provided. So our expansion includes both some additional beds or in the case of, you know, um, the River Street Camp or the <coughs> AFC Safe Spaces Parking Program, we've added tents or we've added um, safe parking areas, but we've also added a substantial number of additional nights of service at our various sheltering programs. Um, the total capacity of these programs, you're seeing the total bed nights on this chart, but the total capacity includes 140 year-round beds and 30 year-round safe parking spaces. And additionally, there are um, 60 tent sites available for nine months of the coming year and 55 additional winter shelter beds. Um, I would like to make a specific note that these are the programs that this office is working on and there are extensive other uh, sheltering programs available in the community, Pajaro Valley Shelter Services, for example, or the Homeless Services Center's Rebelly Shelter. There's, this is not all of the emergency shelter, but what this office has been working on. <clears throat> this year marked a substantial increase in the scope and responsibility of this office. The budget has doubled, an additional staff position has been added, and with the influx of Measure G and state funds, the responsibility of this office has expanded from oversight of a single winter shelter contract to $10.6 million in contracts uh, for all of the various heap and cash programming. Um, there will be significant work to be done in this coming year with the local awardees and the state on both reporting and evaluation, and I'll keep your board updated as we go along. 
Um, and the Measure G funds included in this budget will be supporting Navigation Center and services. Some of that uh, is going to be allocated to South County. Some of it will work in North County. Um, and then additionally, a significant new responsibility of this office will be assuming responsibility for the Homeless Action Partnership lead agency, which will transition July 1st from the planning department to the CAO's office. And as the lead agency, there will be critical work to do supporting our homeless um, management information system processes, as well as our youth homelessness demonstration project. These are some areas where there hasn't been really sufficient staffing to provide the level of support needed, and we're gonna take that to a higher level. Um, and then through the work of focused strategies, it's anticipated that by the end of the coming year, we'll have some recommendations on uh, the governance model, for optimal engagement of all of our partners. The 2019-20 recommended budget provides for two full-time staff positions. It includes an increase of 970,494, a 96% increase in expenditures. Uh, it includes an increase of 373,438 in revenues and uh, resulting 597 uh, $1,000 increase in general fund contributions. These increases are primarily attributed to the additional um, revenue from Measure G and the state heap and cash funding. And I would mention that as we continue to accept and appropriate those funds and bring contracts to your board, this budget will, uh, will be growing. The estimates included in the 2021 projected budget assume a status quo operation and reflect known changes with a 67,448 decrease to the general fund contribution. This is the year when the heap and cash funds are anticipated to taper off, so primarily this is due to an anticipated reduction in those revenues <coughs> and related expenditures. In this next section of the presentation, I'll be discussing our county operational plan objectives and additional work that this office will be focusing on in the coming year. Um, as mentioned, there will be another substantial increase in the scope of responsibility of this office as we take on the, the work of the lead agency for the continuum of care, lo known locally as the, the house, uh, Homeless Action Partnership. And again, we'll include key increases in support for our homeless management information system and the youth demonstration project. There will be significant ongoing work implementing and overseeing the 10.6 million state investment in homeless services. And there will be substantial work, I believe, planning and implementing the next round, which I will talk about later in the presentation. Uh, so this office will continue to work uh, with all of our providers on implementing those contracts and preparing for the next round of funding. <coughs> the office will also be working closely with focused strategies, providing overall um, oversight and project management for their work, and uh, working at the local level, assisting with the data collection and working with the local providers. Um, we will also continue to work with key stakeholders to expand and improve homeless services with an emphasis on housing resolution services, which we believe are gonna be the key to really getting people out of homelessness and into permanent housing. And this marks a move from these kind of housing resolution services being available on an ad hoc basis, depending on what kind of a program you're in, to a more systemized uh, way of providing these services across all programs where we're able to do so. Uh, the first of the operational plan strategies and objectives includes that by June 2021, we would uh, work with the Homeless Action Partnership to increase total emergency shelter and or emergency bridge housing bed capacity by 2019, or by 20% <coughs> each year over the 2019 baseline. And as you saw in the earlier slide, we've already done a substantial amount of expansion in this area, and we will continue to do this. However, um, one of the things that we will also do is work carefully with focus strategies to identify an appropriate target. How much emergency shelter do we really need? Um, how, how much uh, length of stay should we design our programs with given the realities of our local housing market? And how do we you know, use those shelters most efficiently and get people through them as quickly as possible? You know, up until this point, at least the winter shelter program and the, the programs that our office has been funding are really just shelter. You know, they've been providing health and human services, but not the, the tools and resources needed to actually move people into housing. 
Um, on this next slide, you can see the distribution of those uh, bed nights that I spoke of earlier in the presentation. Uh, we've got about 86,000 bed nights that will be provided. And I would say that the big wins from my perspective are that we've got year-round sheltering now at the Salvation Army in Watsonville, which is very exciting. And they're also going to expand from 38 beds to 50 beds. And additionally, we have the Laurel Street Shelter operated by the Salvation Army in downtown Santa Cruz, and they're going to move to a year-round model. Um, AFC's programs, which are the Safe Parking Program and the Faith Community Shelter Program, are also going to operate year-round. And this year-round shift is important in that it provides that year-round stability people really need to stay um, stable and access services and ultimately get out of homelessness. So our current operational plan objective is to work with the Homeless Action Partnership to increase that capacity, but as I mentioned, <clears throat> we will work with focus strategies to determine what really is the right level that we need. The next objective is around planning and opening year-round homeless services centers in North and South County. Um, our community has been discussing navigation centers since 2017 when San Francisco's navigation center sort of gained attention and everyone got real curious about what, an, what is a navigation center, how does that work. Um, and we've spent a lot of time working on it, talking about it, but it's been very difficult to cite a navigation center here in North County. Um, as mentioned earlier, the new South County Navigation Center was launched in August 2018 and marks a significant success for the South County Homeless Steering Committee in the city of Watsonville. Um, a key objective of this office will be to continue working here in North County to implement the navigation center that we envision. Um, the funding for this is included in the budget, includes HEAP funds allocated by the HAP and county measure G funds in the amount of 590,000. Um, to date, we have stabilized provision of emergency shelters, so we know what that's gonna look like this coming year. We won't have to spend as much time kind of scrambling and working with providers to make sure we have that shelter in place. Um, and the next step is uh, we're going to work on introducing those housing resolution services. Um, but one of the things that we've really started to realize is that not everybody knows really what a navigation center is, and we thought a little bit of time to talk about that would be helpful. So, you know, all navigation centers are focused on getting clients out of homelessness and into housing. Um, they're typically very low barrier. They typically serve the most chronically homeless. And some of the key elements include outreach, continuous engagement, case management, and housing navigation. Um, in discussion with the HAP, we've determined that some of these elements can be planned for and implemented while we continue to uh, work to secure a permanent site for the Navigation Center. We plan to move quickly to focus resources on those housing resolution services, the types of supports that will actually move people out of homelessness and into permanent housing. Um, we will move from <coughs> providing those services on an ad hoc basis to providing them in a systematic way. This slide uh, provides a look at a maturity model uh, where we've been, where we are now, and where we are headed. And in the past couple of years, we have really enriched our emergency winter shelter program by bringing in a variety of health and human services and supports. Um, in pre previous years, we had an emergency shelter program that operated you know, November through April. Um, there were no additional services particularly attached to that, no services coming into the shelter environment. Um, from 2016 to 2018, we've introduced new services including health checkups, immunizations, harm reduction, uh, assistance in enrolling and benefits and so forth. Um, but uh, in the coming year, we will introduce those new housing resolution resources and uh, additional mobile hygiene. In the following year, shown as year two, we anticipate having a permanent site, and we will keep your board updated with the HAP's progress on this planning work. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned focus strategies, whom we have hired to evaluate our homeless crisis response system. Um, this office is providing the oversight and project management for this work. And key areas of the evaluation they will be doing include a baseline systems assessment, 
review of our data, systems performance, overall investment in homeless services, and identifying areas where we can make specific improvements. Uh, they will also be making a recommendation on governance for us. So by the end of the coming fiscal year, <coughs> the evaluation will be completed. We will have our recommendations from them for aligning and improving our local response to homelessness and an implementation plan for a set of actions that we can take. Um, their focus is on building a um, well-aligned, um, well sort of well-oiled crisis response system with an emphasis on systems that we get out of silos and we work cohesively and across all providers in similar ways uh, with lots of you know support and training provided so that people can um, provide the services that are needed in all of the programming that we have. Um, in the next slide, I will talk briefly about some key data points, but I plan to return later this year um, with an updated system performance measurement report last fall in October. I provided you with an initial look at that, but uh, the, the new data will be available soon and I'll, I'll be updating that report for your board. Um, this slide is from Focus Strategies. They've um, given us just an overview of what they think about performance measurement and you know, so I would say that our initial work with them reinforces that work that we started with, with the board last fall and in that system performance measures report that was provided. Um, the important thing about the system performance measurements is that they measure our progress over time and not just at a moment in time, the point in time count that is the thing that most people pay attention to is a moment in time and it measures how many people are homeless on a given day. The system performance measures which are based on our HMIS data look at um, things over, over time. Um, they assess whether homelessness is rare, brief and non-occurring. Um, they measure performance at both a program level and a systems level. Um, they can inform us whether or not programs are actually helping households experiencing homelessness to secure housing and not return to homelessness. And the key measures that uh, we want to look at include exits to permanent housing, lengths of stay in programs, and returns to homelessness. And these are data points that I provided to you guys last fall. Uh, as this office will be assuming responsibility for the Homeless Action Partnership beginning July 1st, one of the goals that we have is to increase the use of program and systems level data by the HAP and to use that data to function at a higher level. Uh, focus strategies will certainly be helping us with that. Um, this will include using the data to guide learning collaboratives that will improve both data and outcomes. You know, we need to increase our data quality, we need to increase our HMIS participation rate so that more programs are participating and when we look at the data, we're getting a better picture of what's really happening right now. Our participation rates are moderately low and therefore we don't have a true picture of everything that's being done. Uh, as I said earlier, an updated system performance measures report will be provided once HUD has approved and um, published all of the data for all of the COCs that we need to report on. I've presented three of the four homeless services coordination objectives. There's a fourth objective to implement the state emergency homelessness funding. I mean, I've talked about that a little bit in terms of the contracts that are coming before your board and the planning work that was done. Um, there's also a fifth objective on system performance, which is included in the supplemental objectives for the operational plan. The supplemental objectives will be included in the final plan that will be presented to your board on Tuesday, uh, June 25th. The state homelessness funding, as you know, we've already received an allocation on the HEAP and CASH funding. There is a new program that's been introduced as part of the next year's state budget. It's the, they're calling it the Homeless Aid Planning and Shelter, or HAPS program, just to make life easy for our local community. We'll now have the HAP and the HAPS. Um, <laughs> the state budget includes 650 million in grants for cities and counties to build and maintain emergency shelters. It also includes, um, are there are permitting communities to use this money uh, starting July 1st for some of the planning work involved, including strategic planning, HMIS, and sort of systems things that might be needed in order to support the work. Um, it's not yet clear, however, who's going to actually get the money. There's a proposal 
um, by kind of the big city mayors and lawmakers that they want most of the money directed towards the 13 big cities and to the continuums of care. Uh, Governor, Governor Newsom wants to spread it out to include the counties, so that's being kind of hashed out at the state level. Um, the current trailer bill language calls for the 13 large cities to receive $275 million, for counties to receive a direct allocation of $275 million, and continuums of care to receive $100 million, and that will all be based on the 2019 point in time count. Um, we will update your board when the state has reached their final decision on how that funding will be allocated. And we do anticipate that the planning and implementation of that new state grant will be another significant body of work for this office. Um, given that the state's tying our allocation of that money to the 2019 point in time count, we wanted to be sure to get this information out to you. Yesterday we released the 2019 point in time count total homeless and total unsheltered numbers um, for the count that was completed in January. The full report, which you're used to seeing, uh, which will include a breakdown of the data by jurisdiction, by subpopulations, will tell us about you know, where people were when they became homeless or what kind of you know, profile of mental health or substance use or health <coughs> issues they have. That information is not complete. That information is being worked on right now by Applied Survey Research that does this report. It's in draft form. It's um, going to be completed by the end of this month and published in early July. We'll probably have a press event for that and we'll update your board when that data is available. So um, the numbers, as you can see from the chart, are down slightly from 2,249 in 2017 to 2,167 for the 2019 point in time count. That's a 3.6% reduction. Um, many communities across the state have seen really substantial increases. So. Um, we are very, very pleased that our number is down. Um, however, it does stand to hurt us ever so slightly with the 2019 point in time count allocation being, um, uh, the number being used for the allocation from the state funding. Um, our unsheltered count is also down slightly from 1,799 to 1,700, and I do, uh, we believe that the expansion of available emergency shelter will have improved that number a little bit. Um, we really didn't know what to expect with this count. Um, since the numbers are down, you know, as we try to make sense of it, we're attributing the slight decrease to a number of things, including expansions in a number of key areas, um, eviction prevention services, rapid rehousing, more Section 8 VASH and DMV vouchers. DMV vouchers are disabled medically vulnerable vouchers that the um, Housing Authority issues, <coughs> excuse me, to homeless clients. Um, the success of the Housing Authority's landlord outreach efforts, opening the doors to folks that do have those vouchers and helping them get into housing. Implementation of Smart Path coordinated entry and a shift among some of our service providers to that housing focused sheltering that I was speaking about earlier. Last year, we adopted eight comparison counties as a cohort against which to compare ourselves on our progress addressing homelessness. This slide shows those cohort uh, counties that have already published their information. Uh, as you can see, Marin and Santa Barbara are also slightly down. Humboldt is really up a lot by 94% across the state among other communities that have reported their numbers san diego county has the largest decrease at 11 and percent and the largest increase is the central sierra coc that's tuolumne amador calaveras and mariposa county they're up 130 percent among our neighboring counties contra costa san francisco alameda and santa clara counties increases have ranged from 16.8 to 42.8 percent so the bay area has really been hit very hard with all of the reporting reporting cocs combined the state has a 15 percent increase that number will change once all of the cocs have reported their numbers so our 3.6 decrease, 3.6% uh, decrease is very good news, um, but it's by no means a victory, and we will remain committed to helping households experiencing homelessness to find secure housing and not return to homelessness. Homelessness is a tragedy for every person, every family, and every community that it impacts. 
<clears throat> it is one of the most difficult issues communities are facing here in Santa Cruz County, across the state of California, and indeed across the nation. The many leaders, funders, service providers, <clears throat> faith community members, and advocates working on this issue are incredibly dedicated to solving homelessness, one person, one family at a time. And I want to thank all of those in our community who are working on this issue, who are dedicating their lives to helping those less fortunate. Um, our work continues, and I appreciate your board for your continued support. This concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to take your questions at this time. Sure. Do we have any questions? Supervisor McPherson. Wow, that was a mouthful. That was um, something else. I want to thank you, uh, Randy Marr and Lisa Benson, for all the work that you have done. It's a very complex issue. It's all around us. Um, it's a sad uh, situation, but it's everywhere in this state and throughout, and in more uh, big, in bigger numbers uh, throughout this state and the nation, too. Um, but we know that it's going to be uh, take more investment and even uh, to uh, really make a dent in this. Uh, my question is if uh, the, the uh, $270 million, $75 million for uh, in the state budget were to be approved, uh, what, do you know, have any idea what fraction of that might come to Santa Cruz County? I know that there's, it could change with the legislative process that's gonna be finalized here pretty soon in the next week, I guess, about this. Yes, it's difficult to estimate it until all of the COCs have reported their data um, because we will be a percentage of uh, the total and we don't have a total yet, so it's, it's really impossible to estimate it at this point. Okay. I, will, I will provide your board with an update as absolutely as soon as we know. Okay, and you know, with a new new program, new crisis that we've experienced, uh, as I said, throughout the state and nation, uh, comes all these acronyms. You know, HEAP and KISH and HAP and what HAP. What was the other one? HAPS. We got it. HAPS. Uh, it's no wonder that people are confused about wh what's going where and what programs are trying to address what. But basically, just to put it in perspective, you know, uh, I guess people have said that. Um, Housing is the key to ending homelessness. And if you look at what we have issued in building permits in this county, uh, it hasn't been 2,200, I bet, in the last two decades. And so, and then if you even take three people in a house, it's probably not even 700. So um, it's, it's difficult to see how we're gonna be able to build our way out of it, so to speak, that we're gonna have to just have this coordinated effort, which you've overseen. And I appreciate more than anything, because trying to get your arms around the program that'll work. Uh, I mean, San Diego's done uh, comparatively well to other counties, and it's. Great. I know you're taking a look at that. We're all looking for others' uh, solutions, but each individual county or city is a little different. And uh, I think one thing that we need to make sure is that we uh, we don't um, really have people g get into one camp, so to speak. And we know the terrible experience we had in uh, Santa Cruz. We don't want to let that happen, but to try to uh, provide those opportunities for those who need uh, a house and uh, or, or a bed night, I guess is the way, probably the best way to put it uh, at this point. But um, I really appreciate your efforts. Um, we have all been really uh, twirling our uh, twiddling our thumbs about what do we do with this and how do we get you know a real grip on it. So um, thank you for your efforts. I, I hope that we can really do this um, in a very humane way, and I know we will, um, but there's, there's also the factor that some of the people who are homeless want to stay that way. They just, we, we offer them help and you can't force it. So uh, to try to force a program that we all think is in need um, is more difficult than m most might think. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you again for your efforts. Um, we're gonna, this is gonna be a long process, but uh, we'll keep at it. And I especially wanna thank uh, the Salvation Army and the Veterans of Foreign Wars and others uh, who have, and some of the hoteliers who have uh, put up bed nights as well, or offered bed nights. Um, they're helping us address this issue as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, thank you. How you doing? Good, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, currently there's a count going on right now. Is that correct? The count has been completed. It was done, <clears throat> excuse me, in January. It's always done the last week of January, every other year. The count is complete, but the report, the, the comprehensive report is being worked on right now. 
So we have the total number of people that were counted in January. That's 2,167, of which 1,700 were unsheltered. But the, the comprehensive report that gives us the much richer information will be available in July. <coughs> and then we're, we're showing what we're doing uh, with programs that we're working with. Uh, there is a Teen Challenge, and there's other programs that are uh, uh, religious-based and they're helping out, so they're, they're not counted in the uh, services that we're providing, is that correct? Like mm -hmm. Teen Challenge in uh, uh, Pajaro? Correct, so the, they're in the information that I provided on Total Shelter, that is only uh, programs that are being uh, kind of funded and implemented through this office. Teen Challenge does not accept uh, any kind of government funding, so they're not a, an agency that we contract with, but they do provide right. sheltering in South County. Okay, but they're, right. they're helping out. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, with the, uh, I think it's called the Rescue Mission over there on Railroad. Paro Rescue Avenue. Mission, yes. And they're trying to open up uh, a shelter for women in uh, Watsonville. Yeah. That's true. They've okay. got a um, prior furniture <coughs> business that they're trying to convert to a shelter, but they're, I don't know what the timeline of their project is. Yeah, I know. They're, they're still working on it. Okay, I thank I think you. they're mired in planning, but... <laughs> Well, we're, we're working with them. Uh, we're we're not uh, we, we're not giving them money. <laughs> they don't want money. They're doing it on their own. But correct. <clears throat> when you combine everybody working together and trying to uh, you know confront this uh, situation, it's uh, it's it's nice to see that we're that we have people moving on all fronts trying to you know help out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a quick question, two quick questions. One is when we get the data on the comparable counties, will you get it to us in a report? Because be, it's very helpful to see sort of how we're doing versus other similar size counties that. The, okay. the data that you're referring to, is that the, com the co point in time count the or the system counts. performance measures? Well, both. Both. I mean, I'm both. planning to, re yeah. <clears throat> to re report to you on the system performance measures at a later date when Perfect. that data is available. The, the COCs. Count, just get us a memo Absolutely. Uh, showing us those numbers. So that would be happy great. to do that. And then the second thing is, um, so one of the most, and let me just preface this by saying <coughs> I totally recognize that uh, you've been running around putting out fires and establishing shelters and dealing with state money and everything else. So this is, <clears throat> this is, uh, this hasn't been on the forefront, but if we want to talk about uh, families that are at risk of homelessness, how do we establish what that baseline number is? How do we know what success looks like? I know we have we have some security deposit programs and you know first month's rent programs, uh, evictions, but how do we know how much of the population we're helping at the right time, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, for that for for prevention, people who aren't even um, who hopefully never experience homelessness but are very much at risk. That's a really good question. Uh, right now, families that are at risk of homelessness would never be entered into our homeless management information system, so they're not going to be part of, and I think that's one of the sort of the, the failures of our data, if you will, is that we can know how many people we've helped into housing if they were homeless, but not necessarily how many people we prevented from falling into homelessness or who were homeless and we diverted them away from the homeless systems of care because of homeward bound or because we were able to provide some conflict resolution and they were able to reunite with a family member, for example. Um, we will be working with focus strategies as well as our lead uh, HMIS agency to look at how we can implement some of these things to capture that kind of data. Uh, I think uh, it's very important for us to understand both how we're stopping the inflow as well as dealing with the population that is homeless and, and how we're exiting them from homelessness because it's all part of the same continuum, if you will. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I, going forward, it would be great. We're making these uh, significant investments in early childhood um, in order to prevent trauma. One of the most important ways to prevent trauma, obviously, is families uh, who are at risk of homelessness and their kids. Mm -hmm. And so knowing what, how big that population is and what we're doing um, and whether we can increase it would be, would be important. So we'll, we'll see what we can do in terms of finding a way to capture that data, but we don't have a great mechanism yeah. for it at this time. And I would assume so, but if, if we can figure out something going forward, that'd be great. Thank you. 
Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Obviously, this is an issue in which there is a considerable amount of public attention uh, uh, towards, and um, I appreciate all the efforts that have been going on to uh, address uh, the problem we have here in Santa Cruz, and I look forward to getting additional information about the point in time uh, count because there's always lots of good information in there. It is, it, we should uh, we should celebrate the fact that the number is is moving in the right direction. Uh, it doesn't mean the work is over. It means that we it it means that we have some promising signs of of some strategies that may be successful, and we need to uh, continue to push on that. Um, I'm particularly happy also to see the number of unsheltered uh, people going down because I think you're right that that is a reflection of have, creating more uh, emergency shelter space. Um, but the idea that there's even a hundred less people who are not sleeping outside uh, tonight um, is is a is a good um, measure uh, and something we we should also uh, celebrate. It was interesting looking at the other. Uh, counties that we compare to, uh, and noticing um, the declines in, in two out of the three, uh, especially when we saw the, uh, the the numbers from most Bay Area counties, which were uh, alarming. Um, Alameda County at 43 percent, and uh, you know others, uh, and uh, even uh, Los Angeles, I think, was up um, in, in 20 or 30 percent. Uh, and they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on um, on homeless assistance. So uh, we're moving in the right direction. Let's let's keep on pushing. And I think we have a reasonable strategy to to, to keep on working on that. I wanted to ask about the navigation center. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, hard to remember. Last year, there seemed to be. Um, there was a, initially agreement about a, a location for a temporary navigation center in which staff put time into, and then it didn't move forward, and we reopened the winter shelter at the VFW and later at uh, Laurel Street. Um, are we still uh, going to try to work to get that, uh, that interim navigation center open, or should we expect that the, the winter shelter program will operate again? Uh, next fall? This coming winter, we do expect the winter shelter program to operate. Um, we've, as I mentioned, extended some of our programs to operate year round, and uh, but the VFW shelter program would not be one of them. We would only do that during the winter season. Uh, it's very likely this would be the last year we would need to do that. We hope that next year we really will have a site. Um, it is also the case that right now the armory, <coughs> excuse me, is under construction and that has been a traditional winter sheltering location. At some point in the future it will become available again and that's <coughs> a larger facility that we could potentially use. <coughs> Um, I'd like to add one thing to that. Uh, as Rainey mentioned, uh, we have a model around a navigation uh, a navigation center and a particular kind of sheltering oper operation. Some of those beds would probably be emergency basis, but most of those would be referral basis beds um, where folks might be staying there with an expectation of, you know, 30, 45, 60 days on a path to housing. It's very likely we will continue to need some kind of supplementary emergency shelter. So whether it's an, at the armory and particularly in the winter. So I do want to make sure that we're clear that emergency shelter, sort of that walk-in shelter, um, we may still need to be doing that as well as a navigation center, both in North County and South County. We will work through some of those numbers with uh, focus strategies as we better understand the flow through our system. Sure. Um, and I think that um, <coughs> it will be important for us uh, going forward to figure out, you know, what what other programs we could be using to keep people in their houses. Yep. I'll, I'll be looking forward to, 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 the, uh, to the point in time information to see what percentage of people have been homeless for less than a year? That number has traditionally been 40% or greater, and those to to be able to target that group to exactly. keep them in housing would yeah. be could make a huge difference uh, in the number of homeless uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness in our community. Um, one of the things that's not reflected in the operational plan in the homeless category but as part of the health services piece is about doing an anti-stigma campaign. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering sort of 
what your role or, or will you have a role in that or the HAP or the HEAP or the, you know, all the, <laughs> I, I, I can't even, Alphabet soup. I can't even figure it out anymore, uh, keep track of it anymore. But it's, it seems to me that's an important part of um, our efforts, uh, especially as we look at siting facilities, yep. uh, increasing programs, looking for new strategies. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no specific plans at this moment, but certainly a conversation that I would have with Mimi and, and her staff. I think uh, it's interesting that you should mention that because I was just talking with someone about the importance of anti-stigma training uh, in schools and so forth and how effective it is uh, in the area of mental health and other you know, LGBTQ issues. And I think homelessness is one of those issues that you know, people face substantial stigma and we need to get past that. Um, uh, related to that uh, is the need to work with our local school districts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's the, when I've seen the statistics in the Live Oak School District, there's, there's maybe as many as 100 kids who are homeless or housing insecure. Um, yeah. Uh, I, it, it, to me, that's a, that's a huge uh, uh, challenge yes. and really important that we be reaching out to help people keep in their housing or, or um, find housing for you know mm -hmm. a middle schooler who's homeless i mean it's it's just hard to fathom what that's like for that kid uh to be successful in life um do we have outreach to the local schools so we have a new project called the it's part of the youth homeless demonstration project but also has received some heap funding it's the youth homeless response team it's operated by community action board in partnership with county office of education and their goal is to do you know in reach into schools and uh, other institutional settings where youth may be at risk and um, you know try to intervene and assist them you know before they become homeless and on the street and um, you know be excited to report on the outcomes of that program to you at a later date yeah I'd be look forward to hearing that the last thing about the uh, about the, how the funding uh, would work um, and the fact that uh, our the, our modest success in reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness in Santa Cruz County could actually work against us in terms of funding. It, um, I, I think that, that we would be wise to advocate at a state level that it should also be um, look at the per capita, you know, because we hear that, that our community has a larger number of homeless than, as, uh, than some of our neighboring counties or, um, or even our, the counties that we match against. And, uh, we face this in a lot of different ways, uh, that uh, the way formulas are, mm -hmm. um, they work against programs that are actually proving success. And if we're being successful at, at moving people into housing or eliminating the number of people who would experience homelessness, we shouldn't be penalized with our funding. And I think it's important for legislators to know that, that uh, these promising efforts shouldn't go without funding, we should right. actually be investing in them so they could be models for others. Fair points. Um, at the state level, uh, as you said, it probably will hurt us. It is possible, however, that it will help us with our HUD funding, that we will be more competitive as a COC because we've uh, reduced our number uh, and also because we have reduced our unsheltered number and we've increased our emergency shelter capacity. Those are all things that will improve our scores with HUD and potentially lead to uh, more funding there. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Supervisor McPherson, you had one more yeah, question. Linda, um, is, is there any measurement that's been, uh, you know, following up on the stigma issue uh, about how many of the homeless have been involved with su substance abuse? I mean, and uh, behavioral health issues. Does that get into the formula at all? Or, I mean, it's out there. People think that everybody that's homeless is on drugs. I mean, a lot of people think that way. So is there any kind of a measurement? Uh, and if not, I don't know if there could be. I think it would be a good thing to have. So um, there will be a report, uh, the full report for the point in time count will include metrics of the folks that have been surveyed, which is usually a roughly 25% of the total population. They survey um, and they will get data on things like substance use or mental health issues. I think those numbers typically run around 35% um, of the population 
surveyed, typically about 35% have those types of problems that they're, that they're addressing. Um, you mentioned a formula, so I'm not sure if you meant does that number tie into the allocation formula in some way, or if that I, was, yeah, I'm not sure about that question. Well, no, I, I, just, um, I just wanted to know more about just uh, the percentages and it's going to be coming in the report, so. That, I yeah, so it will be the, the current, I believe it was something in the neighborhood of 35% in the 2017 point in time count, and we'll know more once the final report for this year is, is published. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I would, uh, is there any public comment? Please line up. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. I I think it was clear when McPherson and Leopold talked about the confusion and not being able to keep track. I think what we heard here is just a, a house of mirrors and, and succotash. We've been told about stakeholders. We don't know who they are. Uh, we've been talked about government uh, uh, private partnerships, which in any dictionary is fascism. We don't know if money's going to these people or from these people or making a circle. Um, we know that there's a HAPS program uh, by Governor Newsom, whose right-hand man is uh, Lenny Mendoka, who was Leon Panetta's uh, co-chair for California Forward. Their last newsletter, by the way, mentions regional at least a dozen times. They don't mention city or county because Lenny Mendoka uh, belongs to a group that wants to get rid of 80% of the cities and counties. When you're looking at homeless, and we've got an open border that's taking in 100,000 people across cross the border and we have sanctuary cities which you declare here you're jeopardizing every vo voter and and taxpayer in this county it's uh, unconscionable you're taking away their services you're adding taxes to them uh, when McPherson was uh, running the Sentinel as, as an editor uh, he reported vote harvesting by Michael Rot Rotkin and Gary Patton by going to people that are in trouble um, and of course, those ballots would be filled out. The same thing is being done by large farmers like Driscoll, and they have farms around the world, and they rotate people. Uh, ballots are handed out, and they're marked by the uh, the head of the gangs. Also, we know that Ickley has contracts with this county. They're a front for both the World Bank and the United Nations, and this seems exactly what we're doing here to make us more vulnerable and to collapse the cities and move the authority to the regions. Yeah, I appreciate that public comment, Gary. That was really good. I want to be able to share with members of the public. Uh, Bruce McPherson uh, and uh, John Leopold kind of hinted that it's kind of confusing. Doing the political arithmetic, they just seem out of touch. Because everybody knows if you want to end homelessness, it requires effective gover uh, government. Affect a government that's not coming from a privileged point of view. I mean, I've just seen, hearing her, it just, she's out of touch. Um, um, homelessness got to deal with, with three prongs. And I deal with a lot of homeless people. I know a lot of people struggling, living from paycheck to paycheck. You got the, the people living from paycheck to paycheck. You got the people that are mentally ill and on drugs. These, uh, this is what uh, homelessness is all about. People that do fall on hard times, they take about a year before they get out of homelessness. You know, I'm not afraid to befriend people that are homeless, that are living in their car, so I know them, I hang out with them, right? But I, I, would, say that, I would say is that they need some type of uh, uh, um, support team from a um, um, social worker, someone that deals with drugs, uh, drug addiction and someone that a counselor and someone that deals with mentally ill a lot of them are out there and and, and when, when you when you talk about uh, you know the rates are, are, are you know the the people you know the homeless rate is is decreasing it's a lie it's a lie because people when they, they're dealing with ineffective government they stop showing up they start doing things totally different they go to adjacent county Effective government, and the only way we're going to be able to dig our way out of this, like you said, or build our way out of it, is effective government. We need a reordering at the Human Service Department, talking, uh, 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 starting with the top down, uh, Alan uh, Timberlake, she needs to go, and we need people are going to come in here and be sensitive and not window dress, and not create this healing illusion that you're helping the American public. The American public deserves better. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Ray Cancino, CEO of Community Bridges. Um, I'd like to just commend the team that actually has been working on uh, the homeless issue. It's been a partnership, uh, thanks to the faith community and the nonprofits that have been really uh, cheerleading um, this uh, project forward and doing the hands-on work uh, to make it effective and efficient. I think um, you guys hit on some major points that I think need to be part of this plan, which is the narrative change. Um, you know, that narrative, we, we see the data, we know the data is there. We see that it's going to downward th uh, trend the last three um, point in time show that, uh, but that's not the reality that people are feeling, which is something that Bruce is kind of hinting at. And the reality is that um, with the need to invest more, we're going to need the public to be behind uh, these solutions and seeing the results of these solutions. And so I really urge you uh, to carry that message um, during your uh, blogs and um, during your own messaging in your own uh, districts to ensure people are aware that the um, results are happening and that they're slow and they're ongoing, but we need further investment. Number two, I think that there's um, something for uh, you all to know. The No Place Like Home did do a study and did actually analyze the family uh, homelessness component of it, of uh, people that are in danger of losing housing. That's only one aspect. The second aspect is that the COE uses a McKinney-Vinto uh, definition, which includes doubling up, which is a different definition of what we're talking about today. So it's important that you really talk to the County Office of Education and use that number as well. So it's a combination of uh, housing affordability or percentage towards the housing as well as people living in situations that are doubling up that wouldn't be considered in that. Those two totalities give you a total number that can be used to kind of baseline your uh, analysis and your uh, s uh, double pronged approach or multiple prong approach. So those are just some things that are already available so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Thanks, you. <coughs> so uh, if that closes public comment, if there are no more questions from the board, I'd entertain a motion. I would move the recommended actions for our homeless service coordination office. So motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously, and thank you for your work. Thank you, Supervisors. Moving on to item number 28, this is to consider the 2019-21 proposed budgets for core investments as outlined in the reference budget document, approve an infusion of $30,000 from the Local Innovation Trust, approve the recommendations for the set-aside award, and schedule the, cont the continuing agreements list items for final approval on last day budget hearings June 25th as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. I'm Ellen Timberlake, the Director of the Human Services Department. And this morning, Emily Bali, our Deputy Director, will be presenting to you the budget for CORE. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. As Ellen mentioned, I will be presenting the budget for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, better known as CORE. That's the last time I'm going to say the entire name. Um, this morning's presentation, will you click for me? Yep. This, morning pres this morning's presentation includes a brief overview of core investments. We just have to wait and get the left. Oh, there we there go. Thank you. Okay. A brief overview of core investments, the proposed fiscal year 1920 budget, as well as the projected budget mm -hmm. for fiscal year 2021. A, re a review of the recommend recommendations for the annual set aside awards and a review of the operational plan objectives related to core investments. In fiscal year 16-17, the board approved a transition from the historical community programs funding model to the core investments model for funding safety net services. A joint request for proposal was issued in partnership with the City of Santa Cruz with approval of three-year contract awards effective fiscal year 17-18 through fiscal year 19-20. The core model identifies collective results and promotes the use of evidence-based practices and outcome measurement. Over the last two years, CORE has evolved beyond a funding model to also become a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that is responsive to the community. As you know, fiscal year 1920 will be the third year of the CORE investments contracts. In December of last year, your board approved the extension of core contracts through fiscal year 2021 to align with the county's two-year budget cycle. The work on core has been achieved in phases 
with the last update on phase three being submitted to the board last week. HSD will return in October of this year to provide your board with a summary of the progress and outcomes of the second year of core contracts. In order to achieve the core vision and mission across the lifespan and throughout the county, there must be equitable opportunities to experience the eight core conditions noted on this slide. In, a, in addition to community stakeholders, the CAO's office provided input on the core conditions, creating alignment with the county's strategic plan focus areas. The core conditions have created a framework for aligning initiatives, funding priorities, strategic plans, programs and practices. I want to take this opportunity to thank Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen, aka the Nicoles, for their work on leading the phases of CORE and thank the CORE Steering Committee and all the community stakeholders that have participated in CORE conversations for their commitment to this movement. Now I will review the proposed and projected budgets for CORE. The proposed fiscal year 1920 core investments budget is comprised of just under 4.2 million in base funding, which includes the $85,000 augmentation for Meals on Wheels, $150,000 in set aside funds, carry forward of 114,525. This carry forward funding is a result of actions taken by the board earlier this year, 44,525 dollars in one-time funding for technical assistance and seventy thousand dollars from rebudgeted 1819 funds will go towards substance use disorder services as in past years there is a supplemental request from probation to bring in thirty thousand dollars from the local innovation trust fund to be incorporated into the following three core agreements at ten thousand dollars each Santa Cruz Barrios Unidos education outreach program Community Action Board, Alcance Street Outreach Program, and Encompass Papa's Supporting Father Involvement Program. The total core investments projected budget for fiscal year 2021 is slightly over 4.4 million and also includes $70,000 in carry forward funding for substance use disorder services, but is reduced by the amount of the one-time technical assistance funds and innovation trust funds. Next, I will review the recommendations for the core set aside funds. On March 12th of this year, the board approved the release of, of a solicitation for letters of interest for fiscal year 1920 core set aside funds in the total amount of $150,000. The purpose of this funding is to address emerging or otherwise unmet safety net needs in the community. The solicitation for the set-aside funds was broadly distributed and outlined a brief and simple application process as requested by local nonprofits and directed by the board. This year, HSD received 27 applications representing 31 programs requesting a total of over $687,000, <coughs> more than four times the $150,000 allocated. The applications demonstrated a great need for services and the recommendations were developed with the understanding that all needs presented could not be met by this fund. The recommendations for award represent a distribution of funds across service type, target population, and geographic area. The allocation of the recommended awards by service type is shown on this slide. 44% of recommended funding will go to support behavioral health and physical health services, and 37% will go towards services supporting seniors and the disabled, as well as children and youth. This chart shows the funding awards by target population. Almost half of funding is being recommended for services provided to adults, including seniors, and 27% <coughs> is directed to services for families and children. The remaining 25% will go towards youth services. The chart on this slide shows the awards by geographic location. Almost half of the set aside funds are recommended for programs that provide services throughout the county with the remainder almost evenly divided between North and South County. 
As reflected on pages 16 and 17 of the supplemental budget and on the next two slides, staff recommends awarding funding to 19 agencies in amounts ranging from $2,000 to $15,000. If approved by your board, staff will negotiate purchase order agreements with the recommended awardees. I want to thank HSD staff as well as staff from the Health Services Agency, Probation and Homeless Services Coordination for lending their expertise in developing the recommendations. Finally, I will review the three operational plan objectives that impact core investments. All three objectives related to core fall under the focus area of operational excellence, the goal of continuous improvement, and the strategy of providing nonprofit technical assistance to support services, collaboration, and impact. We view our nonprofit partners as an extension of us and are committed to supporting their continued development. For the community impact objective, an online menu of community and program level results associated with the core conditions will be developed. This tool will guide consistency among funders as well as providers in identifying the outcomes they want to achieve from programs and services provided. As I noted earlier, the county strategic plan aligns with the core investments framework. Strategic plan indicators will be derived from the core results menu, which allows for greater alignment in long-term community-wide goals and measurement to demonstrate collective impact. At the broad level, the menu starts with the core condition and then moves through specific options for community indicators, local data about gaps or inequities, and strategies to create equitable opportunities and outcomes over the longer term. At the program level, outcomes are measured at the participant level and can be achieved in the short and or intermediate term. The next objective involves the development of an online library of evidence-based programs and practices associated with the core conditions. The EBP library will be incorporated into the Promising Practices module within DataShare Santa Cruz County and will be tied to the core results menu. DataShare is an interactive web-based tool that integrates local, state, and national data, providing a one-stop resource to explore and understand information about our community. The tool was launched in March of this year with support from the Health Services Agency, Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, and the Health Improvement Partnership. Additionally, the core continuum of results and evidence that was shared in the report to your board last week is a matrix that can increase capacity to select, implement, and evaluate programs and practices along the continuum of evidence. The final core related objective is a joint effort between the Human Services Department and the Health Services Agency to support technical assistance for our nonprofit and community partners to foster collaboration in results-based collective impact investments. Areas of technical assistance to be provided over the next two years include using an equity lens in all aspects of planning, service delivery and evaluation, implementing methods of data collection and evaluation, selecting, implementing and evaluating evidence-based programs and practices, and identifying and accessing new and leveraged revenue sources such as Medi-Cal administrative activities and CalFresh employment and training funding. As I mentioned earlier, over $44,000 in funds carried forward into fiscal year 1920 will be used to provide technical assistance for nonprofits. In addition, both HSD and HSA have included funding for this purpose in their proposed budgets. And HSD has budgeted funds to support equity training that will be available to all county departments. Before I end my presentation, I want to thank our nonprofit partners for the important work they do in the community to achieve the vision of CORE, which is, that, which is that Santa Cruz County is an equitable, thriving, resilient community where everyone shares responsibility for ensuring the health and well-being of all people at every stage of life. 
This concludes my presentation. And at this time, I ask that the board approve the recommended budget for core investments, including supplemental items. So thank you for your support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> thank you, and thank you for the thoughtful uh, work you put in over the last couple years to really <coughs> develop a system that's um, coherent and making sure that the public's dollars are invested in a way that serves the community in the best way possible. Supervisor Leopold. Sure, thank you, Chair. Just uh, a brief question. First, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the presentation, and uh, I echo the the words of my colleague about the about the way in which the department has worked to change a system of funding that was in place for a long time and required a lot of thoughtfulness, uh, a lot of collaboration and communication. And I think you've been doing excellent jobs in those areas. And I like that you always know that it's a, it's a continually improvement, mm -hmm. improving uh, program. It's not a static piece, and um, that shows wisdom, if nothing else. Uh, I had a question about the operational uh, goals with the mm -hmm. project, and it's, it's really about timing. Um, if we're, I'm trying to figure out uh, when the the uh, menu of community and program level results and the online library of evidence-based programs will be done in time in preparation for the next round of applications. It seems to me that it's important to have that, that done beforehand. And I'm just, uh, uh, if you could help me figure that out, that would be great. Sure. The um, results menu and the EBP library will be incorporated by the time we release the next RFP. They will be fully complete by June of 2021, which is the date that's in the operational plan. So the the uh, the next RFP would come out when? In the fall of 2020. So the fall of 2020, and uh, and we'll have some of this work done, uh, yes. and it'll be it'll be fully done um, uh, by the time we actually make the awards. Uh, when you say some of it will be done, uh, I'm just trying to think of it as a resource. I know that Absolutely. you've been holding technical assistance workshops, and I like the idea of uh, providing training for organizations about equity and, and all those pieces, and it seems like this is an important piece mm -hmm. of the core framework that, that we'd be able to see what the information is and know what kind of difference we're making in our investments. Mm -hmm. The community level indicators and the program level uh, outcomes that we've talked about and Emily alluded to in her presentation will be done. And I think the other thing I want to acknowledge is that the evidence-based online practices um, tool, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we will have a substantial part of that done, but I think that also will be an evolving, it's not a one-stop uh, you know, system. We'll need to continuously be updating those practices as they emerge. So I feel pretty confident by the time that we release an RFP, um, probably around November of 2020, that we will have a substantial uh, a number of tools in place that will make it um, more uh, friendly for applicants as well as more, um, I think, clear and transparent for your board. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Supervisor Friend. Thank you. And this is a pretty significant shift from the way that the, the county's done business historically, and I think that it's definitely moving toward a better outcome-based system. And I think I'm actually very excited about having this tool and being, being able to look at uh, the results affected of these programs. And I did have a question regarding just sort of the structure of the set-aside program. The, the board had created it as we were doing a transition. It was created as a transitionary sort of safety net, um, and I'm not. I'm not convinced that moving forward it's the best structure for the board to continue to have a set-aside program per se. I think that um, all these are funded at a 15,000 or less, and I just wanted to get kind of your thoughts from a, I, I imagine a significant amount of, of work is put into reviewing contracts that are basically $6,000 um, both on both sides, both even though you've streamlined the application process, there's a lot of work. And it seems like it would, might be a better structural design to have the, the board just fold that money into core, but with a carve out that's specific to uh, programs that would be applying for something under $15,000. So there's a greater understanding that uh, for these programs, they don't have to meet the same reporting requirements, same application requirements, it's de minimis amount. But that um, uh, what I think is tough is that you now have small programs competing with sort of emerging needs 
in a way that makes it difficult both for you to judge which is better and, and also creates an expectation uh, within <coughs> programs that may be receiving a million dollars in other core funding as to what they can compete for or against. So uh, now would be a, a time for us to consider this modification in advance of two years from now. And so I just wanted to get your feedback on the set aside uh, and that process. Okay. You were right that when we moved to the core model that we did recommend the set aside to your board uh, to try and accomplish three things. One is to recognize that the new core model um, was looking at contracts and applications over $15,000. So we did not want the shift to core to exclude um, smaller types of requests that traditionally had been supported under community programs, so that was one of our primary reasons. And secondarily, with a move to a three-year contract, we wanted to acknowledge that over time there would be potentially emerging needs and one-time only request. Moving forward into the next cycle, uh, we defer to your board's uh, you know, wish in that regard, but I think we could do that in such a way that we would retain some of the primary purposes of the funding and simply integrate it into the base if that's your um, preference, and we could certainly stipulate with that uh, level of funding a sort of a different application as well as, you know, continue to support some of our organizations that have smaller requests. That would be easier to administer on the staff side, correct? It would be. Okay. And I, I mean, to me, I think that, that the goals, well, this was a transition period and we needed time to, to learn what was the best process, but um, I, I just don't, I don't think it serves the community's best interest to have, you know, $100,000 in staff time dedicated, I'm just making this up, but to, to allocate $150,000 and then you have six times the amount of requested when realistically what we're trying to do is also allow these smaller programs uh, an equal opportunity to compete. And I think if they knew that they were in a, their own, world that they would actually have an even better opportunity for some of these applications that are 3000 or $6,000. So I think when it comes back for action, I, mean, I think that it's something the board should, should consider having come back as uh, what that would look like and just folding this into the base with a carve out specific to these small programs. Yeah, I, first of all, I think uh, the you and your office is to be congratulated and uh, this county too for setting aside or including $4.4 million for this purpose. Uh, we made a big bump in this a couple, three years ago and I'm glad to see that going on and I think that uh, the ongoing approach that we've had to core services that it might be in line for some improvements though have really been able to present a predictable way of what we're going to be funding for our partners with more transparency and integrity. And I'm especially uh, excited to see the $85,000 augmentation for uh, Meals on Wheels included. Um, as far as the, um, the set-asides, uh, it's really important, I think, that we have the $15,000 for the Seniors Council. Uh, we mentioned yesterday about um, in the of programs for the objectives and the operational plan that uh, we're going to have some um, policies that improve our healthy communities for our senior citizens in the county. And I think that it's about, it's, it's really uh, proper that we really devote some uh, special attention to that. Um, could you describe, uh, you've described the outreach process and we know that there's four or five times the amount of proposals. Um, is there uh, any assistance in helping them apply? And maybe this will follow up with uh, Supervisor Friend's uh, question. And I'm wondering specifically on the outreach and to some of the isolated parts of the county. And of course, I'm talking about San Lorenzo Valley. So are there any ways that for the outreach, I just saw there was 5% going to the San Lorenzo Valley. And so I just want to know if there's a, an effort to try to increase that. We have extensive lists of over 800 names that this goes out to. It's also um, placed in the Sentinel for approximately two weeks under public notices, and we also publish it on our county website um, as yeah. well. So, and we're always, as we learn of new programs and agencies, we add them to the list. Um, I think many agencies get multiple notices, um, but we're always, ha you know, Yeah, thank you for to, your efforts, do, but um, I'd just like to, uh, invigorate them a little right. more. And I just also want to note that um, as we approach the next period, we, we will also reach out um, and make sure that if there are any organizations that don't show up in the 800 list of nonprofits that we have that will definitely um, increase our outreach. 
uh, in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, and also I think in terms of the San Lorenzo Valley, just to underscore that we have a lot of organizations, the bulk of them who are receiving funding through the set aside, provide services countywide. So the breakout by region is a little deceptive in that regard because those are just represent exclusive service in those areas. Yeah, I know that the Meals and Wheels program up there is great and, right. and just so many others too. So thank you very much for your efforts. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, we're doing a lot here and I appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, what, we, what I'm trying to figure out here is uh, at the last minute when we're looking at this, if there's some money we can uh, actually increase with uh, the Meals on Wheels and also the Watsonville Senior Center. Okay, they're both connected in a way. Meals on Wheels does deliver uh, lunches at the Senior Center in Watsonville. And the Senior Center in Watsonville, I believe, has a staff of two uh, paid employees, and that's it. So when it comes to grant writing and paperwork, uh, they don't have a staff that can do that. Uh, but we as people that live in the community see what's going on. We see how good a program that they're running on uh, a shoestring budget. So the, the problem we're having with the uh, uh, Senior Center in Watsonville, which has a huge uh, number of seniors, a growing number of seniors that go there for lunch and also uh, companionship <coughs> and friendship and whatever. Uh, there, they did lose some funding uh, from a city source because the city's having financial problems. And what I'm, what I'm worried about is I'm not going to watch a Watsonville Senior Center close down because the city at large is having a problem balancing their budget. And we're not, we're not talking about a whole lot of money because they don't have a lot of employees and a lot of staff, but they, the ones that, they, that are down there with their volunteers are doing a tremendous job. So what I'm, uh, what I'm asking for is another $15,000 for the uh, Watsonville Senior Center. And then also we've all been, uh, I, I think, approached and we're all aware of a request for another $35,000 for the Meals on Wheels. Uh, again, uh, a very important program and a lot of volunteers not getting paid but actually putting in their time. So uh, I know we have the set aside here, but uh, uh, the set aside is, uh, I think it, we need to find some money. Uh, some of the set, uh, set aside goes to other programs that are getting a lot of money from us for uh, other parts uh, that are underneath the umbrella of their programs, right? Mm -hmm. And and I understand that. So I'm I'm not, knocking one big organization <clears throat> when we're giving them extra set aside for another program. What I'm getting at is we have to watch out for some of the uh, smaller programs like the Senior Center in Watsonville. And I know Meals on Wheels is a bigger program, but they're also faced with a growing population that is requesting more and more help. So. Um, with my colleagues here, I, I, what I'm saying is let's find some money here. Uh, can we find uh, $15,000 uh, extra to the 6000 that we give to this Watsonville Senior Center uh, to keep their doors open? Uh, they did lose, like I said, funding, and uh, I don't want to see those doors close. And then the Meals on Wheels, we're all aware of that, right? Uh, so. Uh, I would I would go with anything with the, that the other supervisors would recommend that we uh, help out with the Meals on Wheels. For Mr. Chair, I think we're sure. going to go down a slippery slope if we we do this. I mean, we we established this program to get some 
certainty and a surety of what, how we're going to face this. And I think what Supervisor Friend said, we, we need to take a new look at it. I think we should. And if there's improvements to how the application process goes, then we should follow that. Um, but I, I, I agree. And I'm, I, could, I could give you three things that I want to have added too. So I just don't want to go there. I think that's what we got away from. And I think we should just stick with it. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure uh, a different process is a better process uh, my, uh, to my colleagues' concerns. I mean, I think we, the idea of having uh, money for emerging needs or emergency needs, to me, makes sense. And the fact that, um, uh, that people can apply for it uh, also makes sense to me because we can find out about new programs or new things that, uh, that we didn't know about, that the staff didn't know about. That's, that's, that's a good way for something, um, a new strategy to, uh, to come up as well. Um, I'm uncomfortable looking at uh, uh, additional funding for programs that ask for an amount that is being an awarded amount. Um, I mean, the Watsonville Senior Center asked for six and they're getting six, or did they ask for more and they're? I believe they may have asked for 10. Yeah. Um, Let me see. Yeah, sure. Can you hear out here? We can't hear you. Yeah, you want to your, your microphone, microphone. You want to speak into the microphone. No. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, because the, the, they did lose some funding from the city because sure. the city has problems uh, trying to balance their budget. Yeah, and I know so the Meals on Wheels program actually put in a, a request for funding that didn't get funded. I, right. I don't know how much their request was for. 35,000. 35,000, yeah. And uh, I recognize the value of that program. Yeah. Uh, Supervisor Farm? Well, well, just building off of what my colleague said, uh, if, when you read the programs that applied and you read the programs that funded, they're disproportionately not emerging needs. They're disproportionately small programs. You could look at them, though, either way, as long as it's a 15,000. I'm just saying structurally it could fit into something that would save a significant amount of staff time and allow, say, the diversity center, which may have an emerging need, but it's really just applying for a small program grant to actually be able to uh, know where that carve out would come from specifically. I mean, I, and I, to Supervisor McPherson's point, I'm in agreement about, that, about what the board has been trying to do is avoid sort of these earmarks at the end. But what I would encourage my colleagues who want to potentially move money to, to then look at the 150,000 here and say what you're going to defund. I mean, that's that's why we did this. So if there's a program here, uh, for example, if you want to um, fund the Watsonville Senior Center for additional funds, then go through the list here and say which program won't be funded as a result. That's what we ask staff to do. I mean, we challenge them when they get these applications. We give them $150,000 cap. Um, they look and make a very difficult decision based on the board's priorities and direction that we gave them to fit uh, 600 plus thousand dollars into a hundred and fifty thousand dollar box so it's strange that we then would not do the same thing this is what we are supposed to do during budget time and i think that that's what a budget is it, it's a world of competing priorities that means that um, you know, hard decisions are, are made, and it's not a statement of, a, of an individual value of a program as much as the macro reality of what this is. So if there are uh, programs, Supervisor Caput, that you, that you uh, would prefer to move the money from, then that's, you're welcome to, in my opinion, make that uh, motion to do that. I think that in regards at least to the set aside, if there's something over $15,000, I think that that's, that's a different discussion in general, but, but that, that would be how we would generally uh, do it. You would have a certain budget number and you would work within that budget number and these are just recommendations. I mean, they're not, this isn't written in stone. I mean, if you don't want a program that's being proposed for funding, uh, or maybe you do, but you have a program that you prefer to be funded, I think that that's ex this would be the time to actually uh, propose that going through this list. 
Well, I, I don't. Uh, I don't completely agree uh, with your reasoning because I think at the end of the day we set an we set an amount arbitrary as it was, and uh, and that's what we asked them to go out and uh, seek applications. And we can see that there's a lot more needs out there than there are than than the arbitrary amount we set up uh, about. And so here at the budget hearings, the we should talk about that and. If there is support to put more money into that, then that's one way we can go. And if there's support to say the 150 is the 150 and we're gonna <clears throat> move money around, then that's another way we can go too. But they're not, it's, at the end, the five of us are the decision makers. We've asked the staff with the process and they've, and they've honored that process. And if we, and, and we get to choose we have to make sure that there's money, but we have to choose uh, um, uh, what we would do. Uh, so, uh, just like anything. Yeah, I, uh, if I'll respond to that. I, uh, again, we, we have some that we're always helping out with hundreds of thousands of dollars. <coughs> and uh, I, I notice in the supplemental, we're actually giving them more. And then what I'm getting at is those are I'm not mentioning names because uh, uh, they're good programs. We, we have to look out for the small programs too. And they're the ones that fall through the cracks. They don't have, uh, like I said, uh, somebody with college degrees sitting there and writing grants for them. We're talking about a program, at least with the Watsonville Senior Center, that uh, again has really no staffing other than volunteers. <coughs> And at the same time, something unexpected came up where they lost funding uh, from the uh, from the city, and so they're stuck. So uh, that's that's what we do. We represent people in our area, and we know what's going on. If you were to tell me that something's happening up in uh, North County or Santa Cruz or Aptos or whatever, uh, I would go with what you're seeing because you live there. So I'm looking at a senior program that definitely needs some help, and we're talking about really not a whole lot of money. Uh, I, I, I can't, you know, sit on their staff as a volunteer and write grants for them, but uh, what I see is the work that they are doing. And uh, all you have to do is go down there uh, about a half an hour from now when they have the lunch program going, they have music there, they have fellowship, and then they have Meals on Wheels showing up uh, at noon to, uh, you know. Uh, and we're talking about a growing population in Santa Cruz County, which is a senior population. A couple of us up here are approaching that age real quick. <coughs> we're actually in it. So I, I'd like to see these programs sort of hang around for a while in order for the younger colleagues to be able to enjoy it someday too. So, Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm making a motion. Well, I'll make, yeah. First we have to have public comment. Right. But and um, I guess I'd say the following thing, which is um, to Supervisor McPherson's point, $50,000 that are your priorities, um, Four more of us could easily come up with $50,000 that are uh, our priorities in our district uh, from the 31 groups that applied and most of whom didn't get funded uh, or, or outside that. Um, that's a $250,000 expenditure, which gets, gets serious over time. What I, so, there's, so let me just make this, um, let me make the following proposal, which is I think that the smaller programs that Supervisor Friend mentioned and the amount of time and staff and some of the disadvantage that maybe some of the programs that you're talking about where they don't have the staff, I think Supervisor Friend is offering a potential solution down the road to make it easier for people to apply and easier on our staff and uh, for these smaller grants. For the $50,000 that you're asking for now. That's uh, 15 plus 35, right? Correct. Okay, so um, if we could separate them, I'd do that too. Right, so we're, I don't think we're gonna make any decision about the small programs right now. And, and, the, and the 35 but, is actually countywide. That is countywide, but I guess what I'd say is this, is, is, it's my understanding that there's some money uh, potentially in the last day for each district for some capital projects, and maybe you could work 
with uh, the CAO um, to allocate your money uh, to these programs as, as the thing that you want to uh, spend, spend the funds on um, so we don't get into a situation where uh, during this core process, each of us is, um, we ask the staff, as people mentioned, staff to do the hard work, make hard choices, and next year, I think if, if, if these programs got funded, I, what's gonna stop 25 programs from being here saying, we do good work and we're really important and we didn't get funded and we're gonna be back to where we were the first time. So what I would recommend is that you We'll figure out this, the small programs will be a program, uh, will be a change, potential change going forward, but that you work with the CAO uh, between now and, uh, and, and next Tuesday to, to figure out how you can um, get, get that allocation. All right. Uh, well, I, I, or, well, it looks like. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, uh, there are two, two separate ones here. Do I have the support when I'm talking to the CAO about the Meals on Wheels, 35,000, which is countywide, and then the other one, the smaller one because of a crisis in Watsonville with the Senior Center uh, of 15,000. That one would be my, uh, that's the one I know uh, real closely. I think you're bringing this forward, but I think the CAO has something he wants to offer. Uh, well, I was uh, I was actually going to state that I th I think they're separate issues. I was going to bring um, uh, talk to the board about potential uh, funding for some capital projects in your districts regarding um, um, capital one-time items like parks, for example, in your districts. I'm reluctant to use this uh, the money that we are that I'm going to suggest on last day. Uh, out of contingencies for ongoing costs, because these are really ongoing costs, they're not really one dime. And I'm worried once you put them there, then they become part of the base, and now the 150,000 becomes 200,000, because then you have to cut them next year, right? And then they're in, and the money that I'm talking about is potentially one time money, and therefore I um, would be more comfortable using that money for capital projects like parks or um, other one time uses. Yeah, so and, I would try. And, I would like to keep the option. Sure. Let me let separate. me just say that I I meant it to be a one time use. Uh, that if if that's where it wasn't meant to to add to the base or add to the but right. the, if if Supervisor Caput wanted to instead of doing a capital project, allocate the money. Um, it's that, uh, it it comes up every year. I, I'm always arguing for the uh, senior center in Watsonville because of again they're they're they don't. They don't have somebody that's actually writing up grants, and they're they're too busy uh, working uh, and you know rolling up sure. their sleeves and doing all the work at the senior center. Okay, so uh, so um, now is an opportunity for public comment. Anyone who would like to speak to us, please uh, line up. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, it's very hard for people to participate. Uh, there's uh, under this agenda item, uh, there's 28 different pages somebody would have to review. It's not in the back of the auditorium. One has to walk, uh, you know, uh, 25 yards in order to uh, uh, go through to see what you guys are even talking about. And to rename it core investments instead of community programs is a, a, a sneaky way that uh, the uh, CAO and other people do. I, I wonder how many of you could tell me right now what smart path was in the audience or you here that was part of the previous presentation. But the people here work hard in the community. They budget their money. They're capable of making their own charities. The people, you should let them make the charity. You go out and tax them, take their money away, and then offer this charity thing. This is nothing more than politicking and you know it. Uh, organizations like Community Action Board, all they are, they're filled with political activists and your friends and you know it. A homeless action partnership. You use the same words, you're not even that smart. I agree with Zach Friend this time. I seldom agree with him, but that slush fund you have there of 150,000 
$1,000 portrayed year after year is outrageous. That's the most outrageous thing here, and you guys didn't even agree with him on that. I think, uh, I think this is a scam. Uh, you need to break your contracts with the UN and World Bank, which is ICLEI, and this county has contracts with them. You need to break your contracts with AMBAG, which is stealing our authority and self-government, and you need to break your contracts with the County of Fort Hill League of Cities, which is no more than a political lobby taking away citizens' rights and able to talk to you under the Rosenberg Act, which you adopted, which is fascist. Hi, I'm Deanna Zachary from the Diversity Center, the LGBTQ Center in town. Um, I first want to say thank you for moving to the core process because uh, while we got some small funding uh, for, for years from you, the core process opened it up so that we could get a little more funding. And so it's really helped us with our youth program and our senior program. So I want to say thank you to Ellen Timberlake and also Emily Bali for the whole core process because it, it really was a game changer for us. Um, just to say a little bit, you know, we're able, uh, we have about 600 youth that we serve, LGBTQ youth, and I think it was really important that you were talking about homelessness right before this, because I wanted to mention every day we get kids, LGBT youth, coming to our center, and they've been kicked out of their homes, and they're homeless because of being gay, and so, um, it, you know, it's something that we face every day, and I think I really wanted to bring to our consciousness, the data shows about 41% of young people, 18 to 25, who are homeless are gay. So homelessness is really a, a gay issue also. The core set aside has been really important for us also. Um, the, the department has recommended that we get um, core set aside funding for Latinx youth in Watsonville and young adults and also transgender folks. And those are emerging needs for us. We're getting um, constant calls and people walking in that are transgender, that are homeless, that need support, and we have 18, now we have 18 support groups a month for transgender people to, to, to that, you know, can be funded by this, this core set aside. Um, same thing with Latinx youth in Watsonville. We've been serving uh, kids ages 12 to 18 who can't be out to their family, maybe they're not out as gay in school, but they come to our youth group and they get support, and um, then they asked us for further support um, from ages uh, 18 to 25, so this money helps us support them. Thank you. Morning. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Hurd, and I just want to speak uh, supporting Meals on Wheels. Um, being a senior, I, I know I look young, but I'm 66, and I go there and uh, just to give you a little facts to put things in perspective, um, San Francisco, Seattle, is more expensive except for food, cost of living. Santa Cruz is 6% less than Hawaii. Um, the thing is, you know, people, the food is cheaper here, but a lot of these people, I think they have to put their, for their rent and their other things they have to pay, they have to put some of the money for their food that they have. Being a trainer and a coach, I enjoy going and seeing that these people, they have a very safe place, they have a very healthy, good meal, and um, you know, being older, it's hard to uh, get a good meal. So there I can be guaranteed I'm gonna get a good meal, I'm gonna go in a safe place, where it's run great, and the gentleman that runs it back here, he's, uh, he's great at keeping things nice and in order. So I hope that, that it continues to go so the seniors, they don't have to go to sleep in, without a healthy, good meal, at least one guaranteed a day. Um, so thank you. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors. Lisa Berkowitz, Community Bridges Meals on Wheels. I'm here today to ask you to please consider our request for set-aside funds for senior meals. 
In the past, Meals on Wheels has been very fortunate in having wonderful support from the Board of Supervisors, and that has helped us to provide thousands and thousands of seniors with millions of meals, making a huge difference in their ability to stay independent. We are also doing very important work when we advocate for the seniors we serve. We're ensuring that they have a voice that is heard. There are lots of seniors here today. There are staff, there's volunteers behind me that want to share some thoughts and feelings with you about senior issues, about seniors who can't be here to express their thoughts. So please listen with your hearts and consider our request. Thank you. Hello. <coughs> I volunteer at the Ben Lomond Meals on Wheels. My name is Penny Drew. I am 96 years old. I have been eating Meals on Wheels lunches for 21 years. I hope with your help, it goes on for another 21. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Gotta love her. Um, I'd like to read a letter from uh, Mr. Hernandez. He is a caregiver for his mother. This letter, uh, to whom it may concern, this later letter is to state the tremendous life-saving service Meals on Wheels program has given us. We are both extremely low-income residents of Santa Cruz County. My mother is a 95-year-old, bedridden, extremely infirm woman who is incapable of caring for herself. I am a cancer patient and her caretaker. It is nearly overwhelming on most days to cope with simple daily activities. Thank God that Meals on Wheels provides us with their lifeline so we can have something solid and nutritious to eat when otherwise we would have to do without. Please understand and... Please understand how valuable and necessary the service they provide for folks like us truly is and continue to help fund their great work. One more letter from a woman who's also a caregiver for an elderly parent. I just want to express my appreciation for the muchly needed help we have received from Meals on Wheels. Without your help, these would have been many rough days. We don't have transportation, so we are thankful for the delivery service. I'm a caregiver for my mother who is 91 and with full dementia. With her health issues and my own, we get overwhelmed. Your service is, makes life so much easier. Thank you. First time for me being up here. I'm Mike Rios, uh, Meals on Wheels, Loud Nelson Sight. I brought you guys some plates. Read them. I have some artists over there. Thank you. <clears throat> My name's Thomas, and uh, I attend the Senior Meals on Wheels lunch program as a senior citizen of America, and also as a homeless, no, a houseless person. Um, this is one of the best programs there ever has been. It needs to be refunded because for many of us, at least for three hours a day, we have a little bit of home there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Robbie Shoemaker, and I'm at Live Oak. And this is a letter for Supervisor Friend. It's from somebody that gets meals served at home. It says, Dear Zach, I'm 92 years old, male that lives alone. My wife died three years ago, and I find it difficult to get out to get food. I find it difficult to cook or get out to get food. The Meals on Wheels program is very important to me because it is hard for me to get out with all the traffic <laughs> in Aptos. <laughs> and it's signed George Depp. Thank you. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Kathy Kearns and I'm a 30 year 
program manager with Meals on Wheels, working primarily with the homebound seniors. And Supervisor Coonerty, I have a letter from Mary. She says, my name is Mary and I'm 104 going on 105 and have been on Meals on Wheels for the last 20 years. I live alone and depend upon my meals and the volunteer Chris who brings them. Please help Meals on Wheels as they have always been there for me. And Supervisor Leopold, I have one for you from John. Dear Supervisor, thank you for your support. I had a stroke six years ago. I am unable to cook for myself. I called Meals on Wheels and they came to my rescue. I have received meals for six years now and have always relied on their support and aid. Thank you for listening. Best wishes, John Fraser. Thank you. I think I've been to his house. Good morning, my name is Alma Molina. I am also with Meals on Wheels, and I have a letter from a Watsonville uh, home delivered participant. Uh, dear supervisor, Meals on Wheels is personal to me as I am on dialysis and must have the protein the meals provide me with. Since my wife has rheumatoid arthritis and we are in low income, we need the meals for our well being. Please support the program. And then I have another letter from a Scotts Valley participant. I would like to take this time to thank those who have been helping me. What, what I've been doing is saving the milk for breakfast with a box of cereal. Buy bread, lunch meat. There's lunch and dinner, one of, and there's one of my dinners. So there you go. Um, Carol has been great. She makes herself available to her clients. My delivery is Ernie and his wife, Lou, and they are just great. Thank you. So Ray Cancino from Community Bridges again. So thank the Board of Supervisors for the continued partnership in helping to address the needs of our community. Your partnership not only shows the community your commitment to meet growing needs, but allows us to leverage funds to attract donors, funders, and leverage state dollars. Today I'm here to discuss the growing concern around the arbitrary fixed investment in social services. Throughout these last four years, the proposed total investment has been recommended at the same level. The additional funds have been fixed at 150,000 and the set aside at 30,000 for emerging needs. These budget constraints in no way take into consideration the massively growing uh, income inequality nor the ma massive uh, growing total county revenues over the last several years. It doesn't address the housing crisis or the growing demographics in our community. I'm here to ask that we look to increase these total social service sector investments to be tied to growth and decline of the overall county budget, allowing the county to better meet the needs of our community. I ask that you take a look at the process that has determined that those fixed amounts um, be worked on and that we work together to find a solution. Today we're asking for an additional 35,000 for Meals on Wheels to ensure that we're meeting the current demands of our community. In 2015, we received hundreds of thousands more, in, uh, or thousands more. In 2009, we received hundreds of thousands more, even when the total budget was far less than today's current budget. The trend is growing and uh, growing a disproportionate gap between the people we can serve and those that need our services. That is why every single hungry child, family, and every single senior in our community is a failed policy decision, and we have the opportunity today to rectify it. We urge you to invest more in social service sector, and that you be Begin locally by investing 35,000 more to Meals on Wheels, which will help to feed 3,500 more seniors in this community. Uh, my name is Tony Crane, uh, resident of Aptos. Um, my only concern uh, about CORE, and I talked about this uh, at your previous presentation, um, is that the key proponent or uh, part of it is that it's evidence based. So that means that feedback has to be honest and transparent. Um, so you all know who I am and why I've been here a lot. Um, and that's because my experience is that um, things are not honest and necessarily transparent. Um, and that some, maybe some of the people who get the larger donations have the ability um, and the propensity to uh, tweak numbers and do things like that in order to make it seem as if that things are working. I'm just asking if there is some way that you make sure that the information that you get um, is checked um, to make sure that um, the information you're getting is true and correct so that the money can then be 
um, allocated properly. So that's just my concern, and I, I imagine it's a part of what you do, um, but I didn't see it as part of the presentation and how that is taken care of. So that's my concern. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Betsy Clark, and I'm here today to represent NAMI, National Alliance Mental Illness. And mostly just to thank the board and the department <coughs> for the support in providing funding for NAMI through the core investments. <coughs> I also have a letter. Um, and this is a person who had received some services from NAMI and was not able to make it this morning. Um, her name is Leslie Politis, and she lives in Capitola. She says, thank you, respected Board of Supervisors, for your time. I was born and raised in the county, never expected to find myself in need of health and human services when my 27-year-old son experienced a mental break last October. NAMI as a national organization hit my radar quickly in conversation with friends across the country, and our outreach to the local chapter was life-changing for our family. The professional approach, cost, course availability, and quality content of the course has helped us immensely to be involved in our son's care. We were so impressed with the program, we signed up to become certified teachers for future community members who will have the same needs as we do. Thank you for your ongoing compassion and support of this world-class organization. And I also wanted to take another minute to um, kind of just remind people of what NAMI does um, and also to let people know that they can go to our website and you know find out about services they might not have known about. So we're not a treatment organization, but we do provide education and support for families, also for people who are experiencing mental health symptoms, and we also do a lot of presentations at high schools, at the uh, community college, uh, UCSC, uh, for teachers, parents, and then just various ones in churches and trailer parks or wherever. Um, and we also do some advocacy, as many of you know, with our advocacy on the telecare and also on Second Story. So that's what we do, and actually, I'd like to, oh, timing, perfect, thank you. And I'd like to, um, this is just a list to remind board members of those things. Thank you, Betsy. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Mary Howe, and I'm one of the founders and on the planning team of Village Santa Cruz County which is a um, national model for um, peer support to help each other stay in our homes and stay engaged in the community as we age. And I'm really just here to say, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them and talk to you about it. So, okay, thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Paulina Moreno. I'm one of the project directors of the Thriving Immigrants Initiative and the 2020 Census Project with CAB. Um, we know these are difficult and important decisions, so we thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. Um, I'd like to thank you for your continued support of CAB and our multiple programs, and we thank you for your vision to support youth, families, and immigrants to thrive in this community. Um, this morning, I'd like to briefly speak on three points. The first one being our concern that a reduction and set aside funding for CAB's case management and support services to immigrants who have been impacted by ICE enforcement ultimately means a reduction in services. Um, we know that this administration has focused greatly on expanding immigration enforcement efforts, and we recently saw in the news the president vowing to remove millions of undocumented immigrants starting next week. So we are greatly concerned that a reduction in 13,000 means that we will need to re reduce our services that have been established to address an emergent, growing, and unmet need. Last year, CAB received 23,000 from county set aside to provide education and outreach and intense case management to seven to 12 families. and. Um, our case manager has been able to serve over 30 families who have come to CAP for services beyond referrals. Um, we urge you uh, to please consider fully funding our request for our case management work. The second point is regarding the nonprofit technical assistance. Uh, we understand this is an important um, support for us. Uh, however, the 45,000 should not be coming from direct services. This money should be reinvested in community programs and we respectfully request that funding to support technical assistance comes from another line item in the budget. And lastly, uh, we're concerned that we have another contract with flatline funding. Um, 
while multi-year funding is greatly appreciated when it does not include cost escalators, it creates an additional financial burden on already stretched nonprofits. Nonprofit employees are twice as likely than the general population to qualify for public services. So we are, we need to stop the cycle and adjust for COLA. Thank you. Hi, Board of Supervisors. I want to start by thanking you all and the staff. My name is Jenna Rodriguez, and I'm the Director of Development for Youth Now. We are being recommended for funding for the first time this year, and Youth Now is an after-school center based out of Watsonville that serves middle school and high school youth, but this set-aside funding is specific to our five-week summer program. So with your support, we are able to provide um, the minimum of 45, maximum of 50 Watsonville youth a memorable summer experience and specific to transportation needs. So we'll be taking our youth every week on a field trip. Um, our big one this year is the San Francisco Exploratorium. We do a lot of volunteer service. We'll be volunteering at the Senior Center, uh, joining them in their Friday night dances. And so we're really excited and I just wanna thank you all for that support. Hi, my name is Carol, and uh, I want to thank the staff and the board for all your hard work um, on all these issues. I'm here to add my voice to those um, asking for additional funding for the Meals on Wheels. Um, can't say enough great things about that program. And also, it, it seems like such a s small amount that you're asking for for the Watsonville Senior Center, and I know that the spaces that are available that are safe for seniors to go and eat and have s some sense of community are, are just hugely important. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, yeah, I want to be able to share with members of the public that I do appreciate your political reasoning, uh, Zach Friend. And I do appreciate your leadership on this issue, trying to streamline the whole procedure. Uh, that's good uh, politic in, in terms of just expressing that. But I want to be able to share with members of the public, you know, just all these uh, uh, programs. I mean, we had to go back there 60 feet away to try to ascertain this, right? Look, look at all these programs. A lot of these are just boondoggle expenditures that a lot of them are not even existent. Come on. You know, the hustle is real, right? The board directed and told Alan Timberlake to do certain things and she didn't report back to the board during this budget and she totally bypassed that. That shows disrespect, right? When you look at uh, Transparency California, she's making a quarter of a million dollars. And if we're gonna save any type of costs, it starts with the top on down. We need new leadership from the outside. We need to reorder the human service department and uh, uh, bring in new leadership from the outside. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Um, can I just ask, in our, when we created this new round of core funding, in addition to the set aside and the emerging needs, what was the increase over the previous core funding from the year before? Do you remember that number? I want to say it was uh, 300,000, three to 400. We'd have to go back in and we can certainly do that and bring that number back. I don't have it. Yeah, I mean, I think, my, my point is that if we're going to say, we can't say we want three-year budgets and then when we do a three-year uh, budget cycle in order to give people certainty that it's flat funding. So we can take that $300,000 and cut it up into $100,000 per year and then we're increasing it, but it's the same net, it's the same money at the end. So in the next core, I guess we can break up, if they're assuming the budget's okay, this, what we were planning to give into three different chunks so that people can experience an increase. But I think it's really important that we be honest with each other and with the public that we are increasing money. This is not flat funding. We just increased it earlier so that the programs could have more money up front as a way to, to better address the needs. And so um, uh, it's, I think, I think that's an important, it's important to recognize that going forward. Um, do people have, do any supervisors have any questions uh, as a result? Okay, I'll bring it back to the, to the board for a motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, comment. Uh, 
we're, we're talking about the human side here. That's why we, uh, we represent the community that we're from. And I don't think we're so rigid that we can't, uh, we can't move something here. Uh, when we're, we're talking about public input and we're saying we're doing this out in the open, in the public, and people are showing up and they're telling you what they've been telling us for months in the past, especially with Meals on Wheels, uh, we, we have to respect their opinion and they're, they're coming down here and telling us that there is a problem and we need to address it. Otherwise, why even have uh, public input? Why even have people come up here? So what I do appreciate with CORE is that we have, in a way, uh, a great number of these programs that are pretty much set so we don't have them coming every year and uh, saying we want more. What we're looking at today is we have two that are asking for more and uh, one is uh, uh, the Wattsville Senior Center, that's 15,000 and then we have uh, the Meals on Wheels uh, asking for an additional 35,000. So they're really two different uh, requests. Again, what I'm getting at is the human side. We're asking, we're trying to represent the people that we, uh, uh, the communities we come from and the people that show up for public input, we can't just ignore them. We can't just say, okay, you came here, you said your piece and uh, go home. We, we, we've got to have a heart. We've got to, we've got to be able to listen to them. And I think, uh, I think all of us realize how important our pro programs are from our certain areas. So I, I'm standing up for South County right now, but if somebody from uh, the other part of the county, which uh, Meals on Wheels is really a, a countywide request, uh, I would I would support them because I know that they live in that community and they know how important something is. So I'm going to make a motion that we uh, uh, we approve this, but we add an additional fifteen thousand dollars for the uh, Wattsville Senior Center, and I'll make a, an additional proposal that we have thirty-five thousand or any number that a colleague would want to uh, compromise on for the uh, Meals on Wheels program countywide. And if I get a second on either one, I guess it's two different ones, uh, then we could vote on it. Do you want to have one motion or two motions? Two motions, uh, mo let's make them two motions. Okay. What, are the, what are the two motions then? Okay, first one, 15,000 for the uh, Wattsville Senior Center. And second motion is uh, 35,000 or any number that can be amended from uh, another supervisor for Meals on Wheels. Well, I, I, the, the question about the Meals on Wheels is very clear to me. It's, a, it's, it's an outstanding program. I've seen in the benefit of my family uh, the, the difference it makes for, uh, for seniors to be able to stay in their homes and live independently um, and to, uh, to support families um, uh, and support individuals with the basic uh, food uh, security, which is critical, uh, ensure that they eat well. So I would support more funding for the, uh, the Meals on Wheels uh, program. Okay, so we have, a, that's a second on that motion. And I'll, one last thing, uh, we're, we're dealing a lot of times, uh, we're spending a lot of money on reaction, reactive, uh, programs were homeless, they're, they're homeless, they're out there. That costs a lot of money to try to help them. I'm talking about something that's preventative. It's actually something that we're doing for people before they either become uh, incapacitated uh, or they become uh, homeless or they become uh, lost in the system when they get older. So uh, this, what I'm, we're, I'm talking about a small amount of money that's preventative. We're actually gonna save money in the long run because we don't have to help somebody that nobody uh, went to the house and uh, saw that they were 
uh, failing, and uh, that's what Meals on Wheels does. They're more than just a meal. They're actually a personal contract, contact. The Senior Center is actually a place also that's preventative because it's dealing with seniors and it's combating loneliness and it has programs for them. And uh, again, they're a small program. So uh, I think we're saving money. So let me just. Okay. Let me, let me just say, so we had 27 applications for almost $700,000. Every one of those applications would be a benefit to the community. I agree. Right? But we're not funding $700,000. We had CAB here today. We had the Village program here today. If we fund this program, I would imagine next year any organization that's smart will turn out 20 people uh, for their organization asking us to fund it. So we have to have fidelity to a program. So uh, what I'm, I'm encouraging you to do is I, I don't think you have three votes. I think I recognize your commitment to this program. And I think you can work with the CAO to find one-time money um, from another source so that it's not, so we have some respect for this program and we aren't back to every year um, whatever community programs turn out the most people can get funded. Uh, so I think that's... Uh, I don't we, know. I might have three votes. Okay, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, if you got three votes, I'm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> and okay. program. Well, All right. I'll, then uh, it, assuming that that was a motion, even though technically I'm not sure it meets the qualification of a motion in a second. I didn't actually hear you second it, Supervisor Leopold, but are you well, second? Uh, uh, I would second the recommended actions plus the additional uh, uh, funding, $35,000 for the Meals on Wheels program. So then I'll, I'll speak about a couple things here because I think that um, it wasn't just two programs that spoke to me. I mean, it was I received a number of phone calls and emails, and these aren't these aren't easy conversations to have. I mean, you, you got to recognize that like the easiest vote to cast is a vote where you're just adding money onto something. I mean, it's not like we ran for office here because we wanted to cut programs for seniors. It's not like we ran for office because we wanted to not fund our parks or not have safe streets or we not, I mean, this is not why any of us are serving up here, but it is, you know, it's easy to create a, a sort of villain standpoint when you're saying that I'm standing for some sort of fidelity with a process program and financing. Um, and it's really hard in the conversations I've had with some of the executive directors of some of these programs to say, this isn't a judgment on your program. This is a reality of where we are, just like you would with a home budget or anything else you would do. Um, so it's unfortunate just sort of the, the way that you're presenting it. Um, and I know you don't intend to in that way, Supervisor Caput, because your heart is always in the right place when it comes to uh, your approach to these things. It's just it is more complex than what you're actually presenting right now in this situation, not just in the message it sends, but in the reality of, of where it is. And it's inconsistent with some of the things that the board has done on other elements. I've heard you be, more so than any other board member, by the way, the one who starts the speeches with, we're talking taxpayer money here, and then you vote against an item. And we have a respect for a process, and then you vote against an item. So I, I just want it to be known that that these, that it's not like there isn't thoughtful process up here. It's not like there isn't a care for programs. Um, it, it isn't, we've had this discussion year after year after year where the need is increasing. Things are changing. We just received an entire budget presentation yesterday about our own budget deficit that we have. Uh, best case scenario, six million. Worst case scenario, double to triple that. Um, a recession is going to mean that there's going to be a greater responsibility on these community programs that don't have the financing for it and an inability for the county to provide the funding for it. This is where we're headed. I mean, this is the reality of, of, of where we are. It's not an ideal situation to be in, but I can't support the motion and irrespective of how it's presented. It has nothing to do with a judgment on either the Watsonville Senior Center or uh, Meals on Wheels, which is a program that does remarkable things, as does the Senior Center, by the way. But I'm going to as a result of this, I'm going to introduce a substitute motion, which is for the recommended actions. And I'm going to provide additional direction that uh, staff come back when you provide your quarterly updates, I think they are on the core program, that, that talks about how, what would be a best way to uh, move from a set-aside program into uh, the core program. It doesn't mean that it doesn't, mean it doesn't allow for emergent needs. 
doesn't mean that it isn't for small dollars, just to streamline that process so that we're actually dedicating more time on things that actually should be done than what they are. So this is for the recommended actions with additional direction uh, for that to come back in the next report. I'll second that and agree with you that, you know, all these programs, I love every one of them, uh, Meals on Wheels is most important. We all participate in the, the program, but I, uh, and I'm confident, I feel um, that there's are going to be an opportunity before this budget closes uh, a week from today that uh, we can address that program, but I will second the motion and uh, appreciate every program that's made an application to us. All right, so we have a substitute motion on the floor. Um, yeah, so um, the one that had a second has now been replaced by a substitute motion that we need to vote on first. The substitute motion is to stop, establish the, sec, the staff recommend, or to approve the staff recommend, recommended actions, as well as uh, bringing forward a proposal for these smaller programs. <clears throat> if that, if this, yeah, if this motion fails. Correct. Because we have a substitute motion, and so we're, we're gonna be voting on that motion, which is the parliamentarian's going to come into play here. <coughs> well, that's standard parliamentary procedure, and yeah. part of the rules uh, is that when there's a substitute motion, you vote on that, or an amendment to a motion, you vote on that first before the main motion. Okay, but the, the, there's not an here. It's a substitute motion. And Right, so there's a substitute motion, so the rules are that you vote on a substitute motion first and before the main motion. And, uh, the substitute motion is the original uh, uh, proposal. Correct. Supervisor, you made your you made your motion. You had a second. Yeah. Supervisor Friend made his motion, which is a substitute to your motion uh, that we're going to vote on first uh, as a substitute amendment motion. Okay. Okay. Uh, Chair, I, I just like to add. I, I agree with the parliamentary procedure. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, what Supervisor Friend proposes is not a is is not a uh, a bad thing, um, but I'm not going to vote for it because one of the things that is a it's a disturbing trend to me is the uh, we've shortened our budget process from 10 days to four days. We don't even look at every budget. <clears throat> we don't even look at the, a, a, and talk about each department in which we fund here. Um, and to continually take away choices that the board can make and turn it over to staff is, is, is not a criticism of the staff, but we have to retain the power uh, of, the, of the board. And on one small part, which is a, a rounding error in the $827 million budget, um, uh, I think we can retain some control over that uh, and be able to listen to community concerns when they come forward, especially for uh, critical programs like providing food to seniors. So, so I understand your desire, and I don't, and I don't mean to, um, uh, I don't place a value judgment. I just say for me, I would say I care about the, the elected board making decisions about funding on an annual basis. And we shouldn't continue to limit our uh, opportunities to do that. We should, um, we should look to take those opportunities where they exist. I, I mean, I guess I, I'll just answer it because I think it's important to be answered. I, I don't understand how this changes this. We still vote on core. We still get to say whether we support that on a multi-year process. This just changes it administratively of where it goes. So 
we still, are, we still make all the decisions. We still do our fiduciary responsibility under the state constitution. We still pass the budget line by line on the core component. It'll outline what this will be. And we'll see what comes back uh, in a few months, whether that's something that you think is reasonable at that time. I just felt that it was unreasonable to have a significant amount of time and money spent on something where that money could then actually be placed back into something if it weren't used this way. But we still will have the same controls. Okay, uh, so we have a motion and we have a second. This is super, just for the record, this is supervisor's friend substitute uh, motion. And so uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 I mean, uh, no. Sorry. sorry, no? No. Oh. Okay, so that passes three to two. Thank you very much. So uh, that we now move on to item number 29. This is to consider the 2019 to 21 proposed budgets for the Human Services Department, HSD, as outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the proposed cons uh, continuing agreements list, items and amendments to the unified fee schedule for final, final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of Human uh, Services. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, members of the board. I'd like to start by thanking our CAO and his staff for their assistance in developing our proposed 2019 through 21 budget. As noted yesterday, the fiscal stewardship of your board and the CAO for next fiscal year has put the county on solid financial ground. However, with projected revenue shortfalls and rising cost ahead, I want to assure you that the Human Services Department will continue to exercise that same fiscal prudence in our budget. I'd also like to take this moment to thank my fellow colleagues in other county departments and our nonprofit sector. As reflected in our county vision statement, making Santa Cruz County a healthy, safe, and more affordable community depends on strong partnerships. Fortunately, in this county, this is one of our greatest assets. Our proposed budget is a reflection of the hard work and dedication of our leadership team who are present today and every member of our fiscal staff who are simply top notch. They're talented and committed to the work and care deeply about supporting our programs. This care for the greater good extends to all members of the human services staff, whether they're working on the front lines or supporting our services through critical administrative support, and they show up every day dedicated to missing, making a difference. Turning now to our budget presentation, before I take your questions, I'd like to give you an overview of our department and our current year accomplishments, followed by a review of our proposed two-year budget and several state and federal issues that we're tracking. Additionally, I'll describe how the Human Services Department will support the county's operational plan by highlighting three objectives and the partnerships that we rely on to achieve them. To complement our proposed budget, we've provided your board with a preliminary copy of our annual report, which provides more detailed information on our programs and services. The final published version <coughs> of this report will be posted to our website in July. Everything we do is grounded and informed by our mission. As a government steward of critical public safety net programs, the Human Services Department aspires to strengthen our community by protecting the vulnerable, promoting self-sufficiency, alleviating poverty, and improving quality of life. In support of this mission, we offer a variety of mandated programs and services, all of which are designed to help us achieve these four overarching goals. The annual number of individuals receiving services differs depending on the program, but taken in whole, our department serves approximately one in three county residents. As reflected in this list of sample accomplish accomplishments, whether we're helping those who are homeless find employment or secure housing, or facilitating access to home-based visiting for families with young children, our staff always strive to improve and expand services for our fellow community members. The recent opening of the We're, We're Still Here exhibit on senior isolation is an example of this striving spirit. Nationally at the local level, we're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness. More than one in five people in the United States report feeling lonely, isolated, or lacking in companionship. This isolation has an adverse impact on people's physical health and mental health, especially among the elderly who are often hardest hit by social isolation. In Santa Cruz County, the problem has become extreme with 36% of surveyed seniors reporting that they feel lonely on a regular basis. To address this issue and in partnership with the MAW, local artists, and over 180 older adults in our community, the Human Services Department is sponsoring the We're Still Here exhibit, Stories of Seniors and Senior Isolation. 
The exhibit opened in April and will run through January. By the time it closes, over 75,000 people will experience the range of impacts that social isolation can have on our life as we age. They'll be reminded by the voices of people like Joyce. Talk to elders, get together with someone, talk to your elders in your family. If you have a grandmother or maybe your mother is an elder, sit down and talk to them and, and ask them, well, tell me something you haven't told me. They'll receive sage advice and wisdom from community members like Mickey. When I was growing up, my father's book plate, which said, the beginning of doubt is the beginning of wisdom, was a talisman for me, and it continues to be. And it is what I hope young people will understand, that having curiosity is the most important thing in life. The energy and momentum of this exhibit is already making an impact. We've had seniors in high school engaged in story slams with seniors in the community. Next week, we're holding a companion cafe event where IHSS recipients will come to the exhibit to meet and interview prospective providers. Seniors who helped design the exhibit are now serving as docents. We've even had an executive manager from Amazon Alexa commit to bringing her team down from Seattle to experience the exhibit and explore the possibility of launching a beta project with this community geared at improving the accessibility of technology for seniors. I'm also pleased to announce that the exhibit will travel to other counties in the next couple of years. We've secured commitments from San Francisco, Marin, and Sonoma and are in conversation with Monterey and Alameda. I want to thank Stacy Garcia, the Moz Director of Community Engagement, for her leadership in taking this exhibit and actually the platform itself on the road. Later this year, your board holds a meeting at this exhibit. You'll hear directly from seniors who created We're Still Here. You'll hear their stories and hopefully their recommendations of steps you can take to help address social isolation. When all is said and done, those accomplishments and our effectiveness as a department is a reflection of our staff's commitment to operational excellence. We set our sights, set our sights high in this area. The examples of customer messages you see before you are just a sampling of the phone calls, emails, and personal notes I received throughout the year. I'm proud to say that our department was selected this year by the Federal Administration for Children and Families as one of six national sites that demonstrate exemplary organizational culture as evidenced by our client-centered practices, investments in innovation, and focus on staff engagement. Being intentional about our culture is our most effective tool in creating positive outcomes for those we serve. One example I'd like to highlight is our voluntary mentoring program. Our roots in mentoring go back almost 20 years when we started our first formal program. At that time, we were only able to provide half-day shadowing. Two years ago, we doubled down our commitment to creating a more robust program which moves from half-day shadowing to a six-month relationship <coughs> between mentor and mentee. And since 2018, I'm pleased to report that 15% of our workforce has either participated as a mentor or a mentee. I'll let their impressions speak for themselves. In support of the county's commitment to operational excellence, we'll continue to support this expanded professional development opportunity over the next two years. Now I'll move to an overview of our budget. Our proposed Department of Budget for fiscal year 1920 is approximately $140 million. As you can see from this pie chart, our budget is highly leveraged with the lion's share of financing provided by federal and state funds. We also receive realignment or sales tax base revenue, which is allocated to our county to support a number of social services program. This other revenue category makes up 11% of our budget. The general fund contribution is a required share of cost that differs by program, but taken together also represents 11% of our overall budget. Over the last five years, our financing sources continue to remain fairly constant. The $4.8 million increase in intergovernmental revenue for fiscal year 1920 is primarily associated with the federal and state financing that we leverage to support rising costs, as well as new state funding for our housing programs. Let's take a closer look at the distribution of general fund investment in our proposed fiscal year 1920 budget and our projected 2021 budget. 
In fiscal year 1920, 78% of the county's general contribution in our budget supports entitlements, which are direct cash payments to recipients in programs like CalWORKs, foster care and adoptions assistance, general assistance or GA, as well as provider wages for our in-home supportive services or IHSS program. The most notable development in this area is the successful effort to address escalating county costs in IHSS. As your board may recall, two years ago, this was the single greatest issue facing counties across the state. Some of our early predictions estimated by fiscal year 2021 that we would see a $3 million increase in IHSS at the local level. In large part, due to the leadership of CSAC, the governor and the legislature have reached a deal which significantly mitigates our county's exposure. The result of these efforts has left our overall general fund investment and entitlement stable for next fiscal year. The second year projected increase of $586,000 is associated with a new required 4% annual inflation factor. Proposed general fund increases in social services budget are necessary to cover salary and benefit increases for existing staff. It should be noted that across all programs, HSD leverages approximately 43% in federal and state financing to offset these costs. For our projected fiscal year 2021 budget, the general fund increases shown here for both social services and veterans represents the required county share of costs for these increases. The largest expenditures in our budget are our staffing cost, followed by other charges, which include these direct payments to clients and providers that I just discussed. The services and supplies expenditure category includes all of our professional services with nonprofits, as well as other vendors, our telecom charges, leases, utilities, and office and supply cost. This chart gives you a 10-year look back on our staffing trends. As you note, in fiscal year 2010-11, we begin our gradual ascent from the, great, the devastation of the Great Recession. In fiscal year 12-13, you'll see the significant three-year surge in staffing associated with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. In Santa Cruz County, we're proud to say that we more than doubled our enrollments in Medi-Cal as a result of ACA and our staff's hard work. Since fiscal year 15-16, we've get gradually recalibrated our staffing to levels necessary to keep people enrolled in programs across all public assistance. Now I'd like to review some of the strategic investments we've made in our proposed budget that support the county operational plan. For fiscal year 1920, the total number of staff, which includes unfunded positions, remains unchanged in our budget. However, by funding some positions that were previously unfunded and adding others, we've been able to strate strategically increase our capacity to meet several department objectives. The middle column on this chart identifies the focus areas that are supported by these investments, as well as the unique objective number. Last week, lawmakers adopted the state budget for fiscal year 1920. Although we still await the governor's final signature, I am pleased to report that the breadth and depth of investments in health and human services is unprecedented. This chart summarizes the opportunities in the state budget that will help end deep poverty, increase access to health care and food security, and advance a portfolio of whole child upstream investments that will most certainly improve short and long-term outcomes for some of our most vulnerable children and families. As evidenced in the Thrive by Three report we reported to your, provided to your board last week, these bold statewide investments in young children and their families mirror your board's leadership in establishing the Thrive by Three fund. Passage of this budget will help our local Thrive by Three efforts continue to reach more children and families. I've already mentioned the importance of the state budget on our current and future IHSS cost. We applaud this state investment in a critical program that keeps older adults and individuals with disabilities safely in their homes. We also welcome the governor's convening of a work group to create a master plan on aging and hope that it will lead to recommended uh, actions to strengthen the state's overall investment in adult and aging services. With a divided Congress, many legislative proposals at the federal level directed at restricting access to public assistance programs have stalled or failed. However, we continue to monitor proposed administrative changes that <coughs> impact key safety net programs. 
The most recent example is a proposed change to the way the federal poverty level is adjusted each year for cost of living. If adopted, this change would reduce the growth measure, and over time, in high cost states like California, this would lower the number of residents eligible for assistance. The administration also continues to put forth a barrage of other proposals that are having a chilling effect on immigrants. Public charge policies govern how the use of public benefits may affect an individual's future immigration status. Continued efforts to add non-cash benefits such as health and nutrition in public charge now include punitive members, uh, measures against the sponsors of immigrants who receive those benefits. These targeted public charge efforts have been expanded to include proposed restrictions in federal housing assistance for any citizen or legal permanent resident who lives with an undocumented friend or family member. Additionally, by the end of June, the Supreme Court will decide on the administration's request to add a question on citizenship to the upcoming 2020 census, which if upheld, will negatively impact participation in the census and ultimately reduce critical funding for our community. The cumulative effect of these proposals on immigrants is chilling. Chilling across all levels over time, regardless of immigration status and across all sectors. The fear is real. The toxic stress associated with these policies affect the daily life, well-being and health of families and children, and most certainly come with lifelong consequences. The Urban Institute recently published a new study showing that about one in five adults in low-income immigrant <coughs> families report that they did not participate in non-cash benefit programs for fear of risking future green card status. This quote from a parent leader in Live Oak's Cradle to Career <coughs> Initiative supports the research and is consistent with trends we're seeing locally. Since 2018, undocumented and legal permanent residents have been disenrolling in CalFresh at a rate three times that of citizens. Our department will continue to support our community partners in efforts to mitigate, educate, and support members of our community affected by these policies. Before I conclude my presentation, I wanna focus your attention on just three of the 16 strategic objectives that our department has identified in the support of the two-year operational plan. In any given month, approximately 23,500 individuals representing 14,000 households are receiving CalFresh assistance. Of this number, 4,800 are senior, seniors and disabled single adults. Last year, Assembly Bill 1811 reversed the policy known as cash out that had restricted SSI recipients from receiving CalFresh. Effective June 1st of this year, recipients of SSI are now eligible to receive CalFresh for the first time since 1974. With this change, we anticipate enrolling up to 2,200 new CalFresh cases with the remaining eligible SSI recipients being added to existing cases. Our objective over the next two years is to increase the number of low-income seniors and disabled and single adults enrolled in CalFresh by 50%. Since the operational plan was published, we've received new data from the state on the number of individuals eligible under this expansion, and based on the information, we've made revisions to our objective, which are shown in red. This change will be included in the report to your board by the CAO on, on the 25th. By leveraging as new as well as existing partnerships, we expect to replicate the success we've had with other expansion efforts. Through our CalFresh Employment and Training, or CFET program, we assist providers who serve CalFresh individuals by leveraging additional federal funding to support both their current operations and their expand their capacity to provide more. By June 2021, we hope to increase the number of CalFresh recipients benefiting from these services by 30%. This year, through our partnership with the Downtown Streets team, we've already expanded these efforts to the North Coast and to Felton, and we're exploring expansion efforts in South County with the Community <coughs> Action Board. Next goal is to increase the employment uh, and training support for youth. A key partner in this uh, effort will be uh, Fresh Success, which is affiliated with the Foundation for Community Colleges. They provide critical technical assistance and training for anyone who wants to become a CFET provider. 
And beginning in October 2019, both Food What and Community uh, Action Board are expected to become CFET providers, with Cabrillo College and Digital Nest joining next year. We also continue to make great strides in providing permanent housing for those individuals in our programs who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. Our two-year objective here is to house 187, 187 uh, families and individuals who are experiencing homeless. Yeah, well, wow, that's a big objective <laughs> uh, uh, by June 2021. Before we talk about our local partners who help us accomplish this, let me just briefly uh, uh, share with you the state programs that support this. Over the last four years, the California Department of Social Services has implemented a number of new programs <coughs> that directly benefit those individuals we serve. Three of them, the CalWORKs Housing Support Program, are known locally as CHAMP, Bringing Families Home, and the Housing and Disability Advocate Program are up and running. Together, they've successfully housed over 200 families and individuals. Our newest program is called HomeSafe, and effective next year, it will provide funds to support the safety and housing stability of clients in the Adult Protective Services Program who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. At the local level, this slide showcases the critical partners that are helping us reduce homelessness and increasing housing stability. Finally, you might be wondering how we'll measure progress in achieving these objectives over the next two years. This slide provides an overview of the major in-house systems that we've built over the years to ensure that our programs and practices are making a meaningful difference in the lives we serve. I won't review them all, but I do wanna draw your attention to two things. First, the operational excellence uh, icon from our county strategic plan. You see it placed after each of these systems because it represents our alignment with both your boards and the CAO's interest in continuing to enhance the county's ability to focus on performance outcomes. The second thing I wanna uh, to, to point out is the last system on the list called Spotlight. With the implementation of the two-year county operational plan, our business analytics team is hard at work developing a new tool which will allow us to measure incremental progress toward meeting all of our objectives. This slide shows an example of how this new spotlight system will help us measure performance. In this housing assistance objective, we want to house, permanently house 187 people by June of 2021. To meet this goal, our first step is to establish performance targets for each year. These targets are represented in the maroon bar. The blue bar, it reflects our internal optimism that will exceed the targets. Through a combination of data sources like access to the HMIS system, contractor reports, and our internal data systems, Spotlight will help us answer these questions from all of our department objectives. How much service are we providing? How well are we providing it? And is anyone better off? Consistent with the strategic plan values, our performance metrics will also apply an equity lens and an analysis and include descriptive data like gender, race, age, and ethnicity. Ultimately, being able to answer these questions across all programs holds us accountable to our mission and gives us the critical information we need to consistently get better at what we do. So with that, I wanna echo again my earlier comments and thank both the CAO's office and your board for your continuing support and ask that you um, approve the proposed fiscal year 2019-20 budget with all the supplemental materials listed on the chart. Thank you, and, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again, thank you for the leadership that your department shows in really setting goals and being data-driven, but with that data, um, also is, it's really held in fundamental values and concern for our community, and some of the issues you raise around this administration's fear and intimidation tactics, and the impact it's having on the health and well-being of our families is, is shocking, but, um, but I think, we're better prepared to fight because because we're we're setting up the systems and the goals and aligning the outcomes in such a way that that that'll be meaningful to those families. Uh, are there any questions from my colleagues, Supervisor Leopold? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and all the ongoing work. I know that it, it, it's not just the two of you that you, I see many of your uh, program staff here today. Uh, uh, I sometimes get a chance to work with them, but I've. Uh, was fortunate enough to be invited to one of your meetings to look how you look at the dashboard to uh, measure your progress on not only these 16 operational exec uh, 
uh, initiatives, but uh, so many different other ways that you're looking to improve the quality of service to people in our community. And when we look at the numbers, um, you know, with one in three uh, members of our communities receiving assistance in some way, a Medi-Cal or, or, or CalFresh or something else, um, it's, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that, uh, that we're providing the best service that we can to the most vulnerable in our community. And I know that to a person in your department that that's a value that you carry forward. Um, as I looked at your uh, 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 objective, I thought they were very good. There was uh, one that I had uh, uh, a question about. Uh, it seemed unusual to me on the children well-being, mm -hmm. uh, where it said uh, by June 2021, human services will ensure 75% of the children entering care will receive at least one child and family meeting. And um, that made me think, why, is it, why isn't it 100 percent? What are the barriers uh, to that? Because uh, when a child is being placed out of home in, into another a care situation, and we're trying to do this for stability, um, it seems to me that that would be something that would go on with everyone. Right. I, I think that the 100 percent that you mentioned is our ultimate goal. I think what you see reflected in the objective is some of the startup issues that have um, continued to unfold around the continuum of care reform. And so uh, in our proposed budget, as you know, we um, are requesting that we get dedicated support for child and family teaming in our division through the um, wonderful partnership of the health services agency. So some of this will be ramp up, but I can uh, guarantee you that uh, we will most likely come to your board next year with a corrected objective and have our sites um, set on a much higher number once we see how all this rolls out with the state's um, implementation. You were not putting pressure on the new guy, you know. No, your, uh, no. I, I know, your, uh, I know that he completely echoes this sentiment, uh, so. Uh, no, the, the support that you offered for children and families is extraordinary. Uh, when I saw uh, in your annual report, which I really appreciated that you shared with us, uh, the uh, number of in uh, out-of-home care placements with relatives was so high uh, comparatively. Uh, you know, that's something that I know the department has focused on for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, you. you it, the more you do it, the, the better you become at it and the, the better networks you build. Uh, so uh, those numbers are impressive and uh, will be really important for the future of our community uh, and the future lives of these children. So uh, thank you for that work. Um, regard, with regards to children, I also want to recognize uh, Leslie Goodfriend from your uh, staff uh, who plays a role as a as a co-chair of the steering committee for the Live Oak Cradle to Career program. Um, that program now is uh, several years old, but we're already seeing positive benefits in the Live Oak Elementary where the, where the program started has seen the biggest increase in test scores um, by th a third grade of, I think, any school in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and so the investments that we're making are, st you could start seeing that collective impact. <laughs> Uh, making a difference in the metrics that we're using. And as, as we expanded to, to a second school this year, um, the support of HSD and also HSA has been critical to the success of the program, and Leslie has been a, a tireless supporter for it. So thank you for that, uh, Leslie. Um, on, the, on the workforce development work, uh, Mr. Stone's uh, uh, program, there's a lot of good news here. Uh, you know, uh, I understand the challenges of uh, trying to get more people in apprenticeship programs and the, how the economy sort of works for you and against you when so something like that. Uh, recently at a, a labor event where uh, people really sang the praises of the partnership that they have uh, here in Santa Cruz County. So congratulations on that work. Uh, it was interesting to me in the annual report that the large number of adults, the, the, the big jump in the number of adults that we saw in the 18-19 year, with the economy being the way it is, it, it seemed counterintuitive. And I, and I didn't know whether that was a reflection that we're doing better outreach or we're counting numbers differently or, um, 
I have an answer. to me in a good economy, people wouldn't be seeking services from the... I actually have an answer for that. I um, figured. <laughs> uh, the spike in the number of adults served in, in the Workforce Investment Act programs is related to a change made by the Workforce Investment Board last year where they recognized that based on the high cost of living in this community, they needed to increase the threshold of eligibility up to individuals who are up to 250% of the federal poverty level. So it was a very conscious and smart and strategic decision by our workforce board to bring more people under the umbrella of service. And so that was a very conscious result of a smart decision made last year. Well, I thank that, uh, that board uh, for that awareness and uh, we know here in Santa Cruz the high cost of living. Um, right. If you're fortunate enough to only work one job, um, that's a good thing, but there are a lot of people who need multiple uh, jobs in order to make it. The last thing I'll just talk about is the adult protective services. Um, the work you do there is incredibly important. I've seen it firsthand. I've had the chance to work with some of the staff. I think this is gonna be a growing part of the work of the department as we look at the demographic change in Santa Cruz County. Um, and we know that uh, seniors are a fast growing part of the homeless population. We know that the, that the, the cost of living here is squeezing um, uh, families, squeezing seniors in, to, in order to be able to make it. Um, and we know that, that uh, seniors are vulnerable and we, we hear about it all the time. Um, and we see it uh, at all the different ways in which people uh, target uh, 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 seniors in our community. So adult protective services, you know, I, I, I wrote some questions to you and I appreciated the responses back. Well, we don't have a, a specific uh, operational goal around adult protective services, but we have a number of them which in uh, capture the, that work. But I would just wanna recognize the staff um, uh, for uh, their work on adult protective services because um, uh, people in the community are really counting on, on those uh, members of your staff. So thank, thank you. you thank you. Anyone else? Supervisor. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna say this when uh, we talk with uh, health services too. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate the human services department working with the health services agency. I have not seen this partnership or coordination of effort uh, better in my seven years here on the board, and it's paying dividends literally for human beings in Santa Cruz County. Um, it can't be overstated, so I wanna thank everybody being on the same, same page, and I think having a strategic plan, an operational plan, really kind of forced this issue in some respects, but uh, you were ready to take it, and uh, I appreciate that very much. I think it's invaluable for our, our people in Santa Cruz County. I especially want to thank you, uh, Ms. Timberlake, and uh, your, your whole team for staying on top of state and federal changes that are taking place, because there's plenty of them, it seems, uh, week to week, and ma making, uh, maximizing the resources we have to reduce our general fund contributions that we might have to make. It's really, uh, it's really a, a benefit to our overall budget. And I appreciate your sense of innovation at, and tapping CalFresh employment and training funding, which has been mentioned on uh, which at page 204 here, first time in 40 years, and it's gonna impact 2,200 people in this county. Significant uh, improvement for what we've done there and for the training, the very popular effective downtown streets program that have just uh, gotten underway in Felton as well as Davenport and has been in place, what, for almost two years in Santa Cruz. Um, really important, it's it's just a huge win-win situation. And I was up there uh, walking under the, the bridges and the rivers with uh, the downtown streets team. Uh, they feel good about themselves. It's a win-win, it's just a great program. And uh, they're gonna be on their way to uh, being uh, really significant uh, uh, members of our society uh, as they are to begin with, but uh, contributing to it. They feel really good about it. So <clears throat> that's the best part about it. And that, I know that, uh, is mentioned, you've done so much to increase the uh, participation in the CalFresh program. Um, and coordinating, again, a coordinated effort uh, with Second Harvest and Community Bridges um, for uh, making more SSI participants being eligible. Um, it's just really a, a tremendous uh, that what you've done. I think it's nothing short of remarkable also that there's uh, no, no new net cost to the county for the in-home support services that we have talked a lot about. Um, uh, and thanks to your leadership in the years, the last few years that have uh, really been 
really critical in maintaining this uh, maintenance of effort. Um, and as a, a member of the subcommittee uh, with the with CSAC, the California State Association of Counties, uh, the subcommittee there, I can tell you this is one place where the value of being a part of a team or an organization, a statewide organization with the 58 counties paid dividends because it was a top priority for CSAC and for this county. And it's going to be just uh, provide many, many more services for everyone throughout this county and throughout the state of California. Um, and in addition to doing more for seniors, I know you've done uh, a lot of uh, improvement in the cost for our veterans and supporting our veterans uh, needs to be a legislative priority, not only here, but in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. as well. Um, I, uh, there's one question that I did have. Um, on page 211, it looks like there's a 303% increase in overall general fund expenditures for social services, and I think you've probably explained somewhat, but can you summarize that huge increase that some people say, wow, may say wow, uh, when they look at? Right, that increase over fiscal year 18-19 uh, represents approximately $2.1 million in general fund. And about 1.9 million of that increase <laughs> is associated with the county required share of cost for the salary and, and, and um, benefit increases for existing staff. When I said earlier that we leveraged 43% uh, on federal and state financing to support rising staffing cost, um, that 1.9 of that 2.1 million represents, right it's all about the um, just the county share for our salary and benefit increases. Okay, very good. Again, thank you very much, thank everybody you. in the staff. Thank you. Okay. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, I want to thank all of you for everything you're doing. And uh, I, the, the one question I have is the uh, adult and long-term care uh, facility. Is that you're dealing with people with in long-term care facilities and, and also at home? Uh, are you talking? Okay. I'm not sure I understand uh, your question. It says under social services, adult and long-term care. Oh, adult and long-term care services is a division within the Human Services Department, and that division um, it oversees three programs, the in-home supportive services program, the adult protective services program, and our veteran services. So adult and long-term care services is just a division within our department that administers those three programs. Okay. All right, because uh, it does refer to, it's under a page here, 202. Yeah, okay. And then uh, that, uh, what, what exactly do they do with the long-term care as far as, uh, uh, let's say somebody has Alzheimer's or whatever. Okay. Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, remember that the in-home supportive services program is a program specifically designed to assist in our continuum of services um, offering long-term care because it's primarily dedicated to trying to ensure that seniors who uh, can remain safely in their homes without having to move into an, a long-term care facility. So that's the pr focus of that program. In our adult protective services arena, uh, we uh, provide that service in order to respond to allegations of neglect or abuse um, sometimes those can be self-neglect issues associated with a person's, you know, where they are in the continuum of their um, you know, physical and uh, mental capacities. So adult protective services is also supporting um, sort of the provision of longer term care services by intervening when there's a risk to an adult. But we don't, you know, we don't run facilities per se. Right. Yeah, the, uh, there are a lot of people, actually homeless people, that if they if they got into this earlier, they might have right. you know, not ended up on the street. And that's one of, um, as I was mentioning earlier about our home safe program in our adult protective services area, homeless seniors or seniors who are at risk of homelessness is our second highest um, referral in the last year. So we are very excited to finally have some resources to be able to try to address those needs. But it, it is a growing concern, and I believe overall in the county that seniors represent the second fastest growing component of our homeless population. You bet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Do we have any uh, public comment? Please come forward.
Hi, my name is Stacy Garcia, and um, I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all and um, thank Ellen and the Human Services Department and all of the staff for all of their support um, in producing the We're Still Here exhibition that you all will see soon. Um, and I just really wanted to commend you all for your innovative collaboration that makes these things possible. I think when you collaborate with organizations um, like the MA and other organizations, um, you're able to expand the impact of your work in creative ways um, that you may not otherwise be able to. Um, with the help of the Human Services Department, we were able to connect with over 86 different organizations that serve seniors in our community. And over the past seven months, we've been working with 186 seniors to co-create an exhibition together. Um, and this exhibition is um, having a huge impact here in our community. It's not only raising awareness about the issues that seniors face, um, but it's inviting our community to take action in creative ways by donating to Meals on Wheels or volunteering to lead a gardening group or signing up to be a home um, check-in buddy with seniors in our community. So thank you for your support and thank you for the staff for your never-ending commitment to seniors and um, our creative community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for you. the work that you do. Yeah, thank you for providing the space to, so this collaboration can take place and the dedication of staff time uh, to work with so many different people who were part of the group to help put together this exhibition and even the previous exhibition. It's a really, it's a great community resource and helps uh, educate people about issues, so thank you. Only possible because of this partnership. Hi, Tony Crane, uh, resident of Aptos. Uh, so I really appreciate everything that's going on here today. I mean, this is a lot of hard work, and what you do is obviously very difficult. I do need to bring up the fact that, again, it's about honesty and transparency and making sure that these programs are implemented correctly um, and they're effective. And my personal experience is that it's not that way. So then I look at every other program that way and say, where did, where did something go wrong? Where was somebody not honest? Where was there a lack of integrity um, that allowed a program to get more funds or any funds at all? So I see that there's a big, a large number for Encompass Community Services that you provide. And again, they're a huge provider and they provide a lot of services. However, the one program um, that I'm aware of, um, Second Story, uh, was an abject failure in its implementation. Um, there was uh, a complete lack of honesty and transparency in the implementation of that program. Um, and that's, I've provided evidence and I speak about it all the time here. Um, and so I, that just needs to be put in the record that I just believe that uh, Encompass and specifically, uh, and I know you can't defund them totally. They're, they're too big to fail is what I've been told. So, uh, but in certain ways like that program should not get funding. Uh, it is, uh, there's evidence out there of the lack of transparency, dishonesty, um, might I say fraud. Um, and so that is on the record. Um, and so I, I hope that you do take that into consideration and maybe some of those funds that, uh, and, and it's been admitted that the program is not effective as it's being run right now. Um, so maybe some of that money can go to Meals on Wheels. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos dias. Uh, my name is Nani Alejandres. I'm director of Santa Cruz Barrios Unidos. And I, I just wanted to, one is I want to thank everybody for all the work. Every, Everybody's, we're trying to deal with the issue that we have here in Santa Cruz County, and not only violence, but uh, the homeless. Uh, and Barrios Unidos, we're going on over 40 years here in Santa Cruz, and a lot of people still don't even know that we exist here, and, and, and many department heads don't even know that, that we own one of the largest uh, plots of land here. And so we invite people to come out, and I, I want to thank the, those supervisors that I've been working with throughout the years in terms of support that you've gotten given Barrios Unidos, and not only here, but uh, uh, statewide and national. Um, but I, I just wanted to bring something up on the, uh, the homeless, and, and that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of our people that, that kind of get uh, forgotten uh, and those that are sleeping in cars and and uh, you know other areas where our 
a lot of Latinos, they're not on the street, they're not, they weren't in the camp, in, in, in the Ross camp, they weren't, but they're homeless, they're houseless, and they sleep in, in people's aunties' uh, yards and stuff like that, so we, we handle that a little bit different. But I also wanna, you know, and we're trying to deal with that, but I also wanna just bring up the issue of alternative housing, like tiny houses, SROs. You know, uh, we're trying to deal with a, a tiny house village here in, in Santa Cruz, and uh, it's, 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 people give support, but it's a lot of lip service. And so I just wanna, want you, all of you, because it's, it's hard to get all of five of you at one time, but if you just take a minute and look at what other cities are doing with tiny houses and alternative housing, and I think that we can provide for homegrown Santa Cruz young people, Santa Cruz County young people, that we could provide them a house. So thank you very much, Hope. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation action. I would move the recommended actions for the Human Services uh, Department. So we got a motion by McPherson, and a, uh, sorry, a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We're gonna take a lunch break and return at 1.30 for our, uh, our final item this afternoon, which is the Health Services Agency. Uh, and then t this evening we'll have our 7 p.m. continued public hearing uh, here as well for public comment. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to reconvene to hear uh, the final item this afternoon, which is item number 30. Consider the 2019-21 proposed budgets for the Health Services Agency as outlined in the reference budget documents and, con and schedule the continuing agreements list items and amendments to the unified fee schedule for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the Health Services Director. And we have Ms. Hall here to present to us today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Coonerty, honorable members of the board. I'm joined here. You might want to get closer to the microphone. Okay, let's try this. <clears throat> How's that? Yeah, I'm joined perfect. here today by Director of Administrative Services, who uh, was appointed approximately three months ago, Jessica Randolph, and I'd like to welcome her as well. And um, we're so pleased to be here to discuss the Health Services Agency budget. Uh, first off, I wanted to note that this budget and its development is truly a collective effort of many, many parties, and that it's framed by two guiding principles. First, our mission is best reached through collaboration. Since the County Health Services Agency alone doesn't have the resources or capacity to serve all of our community's problems, the budget was developed in partnership with and informed by other county departments, community partners, as well as those that we serve. And um, we understand that our work together complements each other and also intersects in many areas for the most chances of success. In particular, I'd like to thank the Human Services Department and the entire HSA staff, as well as some of our community partners who have contributed consider considerably to this effort. Together, I know that we are all clearly committed to the ongoing alignment of our programmatic efforts, as well as optimizing our shared resources for the good of the overall community. And for that, I'm grateful. Our second overarching guiding principle 
is that making progress in addressing our health priorities requires an organizational nexus between our community health needs as well as the allocation of resources. So in that pursuit, enhancing and safeguarding the health and well-being of all Santa Cruz County residents requires that we fund efficient and effective health policy and services supported and informed by data and science. And it is with those principles that we move forward. So today, we'll be providing a general overview of the health services agency, who we serve and what we do. We'll also talk a little bit about the strategic framework, which is a part of our strategic planning process. We'll also provide a high-level budget overview, discuss division highlights and their operational plan objectives, and then also uh, have a discussion about the fiscal landscape moving forward. So health services agency, who we are and what we do. I felt like this was really important because I've heard in the last few months more than ever that a lot of people don't understand who we serve, why we serve different folks, and what we're charged with doing. So for some background, in California, counties are the local health jurisdictions. And counties are responsible for meeting the basic health care needs of low income and uninsured residents who have no other sources of care. The county obligation is codified in Welfare and Institutions Code Section 17,000, and as a result, the populations that we serve through Health Services Agency are the medically indigent, those who are Medi-Cal beneficiaries, and then the general public through our population-based prevention, preparedness, and policy work. <clears throat> so we do this through a number of divisions, and our behavioral health and our clinic services divisions primarily serve the Medi-Cal and the indigent populations through direct services. In the Behavioral Health Division, we have mental health services publicly funded that are available to Medi-Cal or uninsured children or adults. And um, the population we serve are those with serious and chronic mental illness. We also serve in the Behavioral Health Division as the safety net to uninsured individuals who meet diagnostic criteria as seriously emotionally disturbed or with serious mental illness. We have crisis services available to the extent that we have resources to provide them to the general population. And likewise, we have substance use disorder services that are primarily serving the Medi-Cal population through the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System of Services. The very basic health care needs of our low-income individuals are met through our benefits division, and our benefits division houses a program called Metacruz, which is the county's indigent care health care coverage system. And the benefits division is also home to our whole, whole person care pilot project. Our public health divisions and environmental health divisions address population health <coughs> through various programs and services that address health promotion, disease prevention, and other efforts to preserve and protect the public's health. And then finally, our administration division serves as our programmatic and direct service division that ensures to support to our programmatic and direct service divisions by ensuring supportive organizational infrastructure and management. <clears throat> this year is uh, the year that HSA embarked on its first ever effort towards strategic planning. So as a department that represents nearly 25% of the entire county budget and over 55% of the county health and human services budget, it was really important that um, we ensure that the health and well-being of our county's most vulnerable populations was served through organizational excellence. Um, in addition, we wanted to have a process that was aligned with the county strategic plan process as, plan as well and ensure that we set our priorities and allocate resources to properly achieve our shared goals. Our strategic planning work has been guided by the principles of inclusion and engagement, and we were very, very deliberate in ensuring that every single staff member of HSA have uh, multiple reiterative opportunities to uh, take part in it. So we started in March 2019 
with a series of virtual presentations. I facilitated five of these virtual presentations that could each house 100 people in a meeting. And these were virtual meetings that allowed for folks to provide input through chat boxes. Um, we also had mission, vision, and values <coughs> workshops in which we included all 100 supervisors and managers over the course of four eight-hour days. In April and May, um, what we did was we took all of the work uh, that was done in March and spit it back out to all 600 staff through a staff online survey to see if what we came up with together through these iterative processes resonated with staff. We also held 10 virtual focus groups of 10 individuals each um, from various places in the organization, both line staff all the way on to leadership. What we did more recently in May and June was um, we had priority focus, focus area workshops. So we took the feedback from all of the prior work that we had done to develop our priority focus areas. One of the questions that we got from staff throughout this process was, we already have plans. We have a community health improvement plan. We have a countywide strategic plan. We don't understand what this does for us. So it was clear for us to articulate to staff that this was an organizational strategic plan, inward facing for our department, so that we had the organizational structures, the management processes, the infrastructure that we needed to be successful in our larger tasks. So um, we're almost done with our uh, strategic framework, which is our mission, vision, and value setting, as well as our priority areas to work on. And the last step this uh, month is to do an online survey to all the staff and get their feedback again on our priority focus areas. In June through December, we're gonna finalize our strategic framework and start developing a strategic plan that reflects the input of each of our divisions. So these are the new health services agency, mission, vision, and values. They'll come as no surprise to anybody, and they're very much in line with um, what you'll find in the county strategic plan as well. Our mission is to promote and ensure a healthy community environment by providing education, outreach, and comprehensive health services in an inclusive and accessible manner. And our vision is that Santa Cruz County is a healthy, safe, and thriving community for all. You can see our values that align with those as well. So moving into the numbers, our health services agency proposed budget for fiscal year 1920 is 187 million and some change. And um, as with many of the other departments, our projected budget for 2021 is a flat projection, and I expect that we will come back um, in between the two fis fiscal years with changes that have happened during the year. When you look at the graph here, um, the top blue line and the bottom green line uh, are the differences between our expenditures and our revenues. So as you can see, our expenditures for the total budget of 187 439863 is um, is more than our revenues and that revenue gap is closed by the county general fund or what we also call net county cost one of the things that i wanted to point out is that as you see our health services agency revenues and expenditures rising as a trend you also see our staffing rising as a trend as well and um it's important to note that net county cost this year is about 5.7% of our total health services agency budget, and that's um, almost exactly the trend for the last several years. So moving along to sources of revenue, uh, the bulk of our revenue is intergovernmental funds, which are basically state and federal funds, either uh, public or through grants. Um, we also have other revenue through um, licenses, permits, fees, fines, assessments. And the next largest bulk of our revenue comes from our clinics, which uh, charge for services. And as you can see, the general fund contribution there at about at 5.7% of our budget. In terms of expenditures, um, this is what this pie should look like. We should be investing the largest portion of our, uh, of our expenditures in the people who provide and deliver services on our behalf because that is the nature of our business. So as you can see, almost 40% of our expenditures are salary and benefits. 
Um, the next lion's share of our expenses go to services and supplies, and then um, other charges such as supporting our space um, overhead to the county, fixed assets, and other financing. So here's another clearer look at the five-year trend of the health services agency budget. And you can see that there has been a slight upward trend over the years from 15-16. Um, part of that trend is primarily due to the increase in the number of, of, of services that we pr provide in our primary care clinics. And um, part of our plan for the future is really to optimize utilization of and access to our primary care clinics in order to, um, number one, better serve the safety net, but number two, use those revenues that we earn to reinvest back into other services. So you can see that as our um, gross budget has risen, our non-county revenues have uh, also risen in um, because of the bulk of our budget. And you can see also the gray line at the bottom, which is the county general fund. The other five-year trend I wanted to share with the supervisors is um, that as our revenues have increased, as well as our company expenditures, we've been able to slowly increase our staff over time. And you'll see that for 18-19, uh, our approved budgeted positions were 568.20. And um, it looks like quite a large jump to 601.85 proposed for 1920. But I would note that 24 of those positions were actually approved and added mid-year from a variety of um, different new sources of funding and uh, different kinds of initiatives, such as additional grants, um, <coughs> the FIT initiative that's funded by Measure G, and um, increased revenues in clinic funding. So next, I wanted to talk a little bit about each division, the breakdown of the budget, and highlight um, highlight at least one operational objective in the strategic plan. So our administration division has a budget of um, almost $20 million, which represents about 10.5% of the entire uh, uh, agency budget. Our administration division is supported by 12% of our general fund allocation. And um, one of the objectives that we wanted to highlight today was number 75, optimizing resources. So by June 2021, the Health Services Agency will increase federal revenue for Medi-Cal administrative activities by 25% over fiscal year 2017-2018. I will note that uh, a lot of these revenues are pass-through revenues. They're not for HSA to hold on to, to provide additional services from us as an agency, but they're, they're funds that we are seeking to leverage for all of our community partners and other departments. So um, in future budgets, you won't see them added to our budget, but you'll see them included as revenue and included as expenditures because they will go out in contracts to all of the participating nonprofits. So the Clinic Services Division is our second largest division. And um, as you may know, our clinic services are federally qualified health centers that enjoy an enhanced rate of reimbursement for the services that we provide due to federal grants. And some of the highlights for our Clinic Services Division, um, actually the most exciting highlight is that we are able to dramatically expand services. Um, we're just about done with uh, adding 14 exam rooms at our Emmeline Clinic and four Watsonville exam rooms. We're also in next fiscal year proposing to add one exam room to the Homeless Persons Health Project. Um, across all of our clinic services, we have really optimized integrated behavioral health, being able to provide behavioral health in a primary care setting. We have completely ramped up medication-assisted treatment, which is the gold standard in treating opioid addiction. And um, we are seeking to fund new power exam tables at both of our uh, Emmeline and Watsonville clinic locations and adding a vision screener in Watsonville. 
So I'm going to go back just for a second. What I wanted to note is that our clinics division is supported by 1% of um, the HSA general fund allocation. As I go through the proportion of general fund allocation to each of our divisions, the reason I'm highlighting this is that before I got here, we kind of used to take our general fund allocation and divvy up across our divisions. But every single one of our divisions is financed differently. And because our clinics division earns revenue, it actually earns more revenue than it expends, um, we're not putting general fund uh, contribution there just because it's a spot to put the dollars. So instead what we did was we deliberately invested our general fund dollars in the divisions that need local match and local public dollars to draw down even more federal revenue. <coughs> So one of the uh, operational plan strategies and objectives that we wanted to highlight for the clinics division is that uh, given the fact that we've increased our medication assisted treatment, given the fact that we've done a lot of work in uh, diabetes education and management, we hope to by June 2021 promote services such as MAT and diabetes self-management education by engaging at least 20% of our patient population in those services. So the Public Health Division. The Public Health Division is, um, the budget consists of almost $17 million, and uh, this division is supported by 14% of the Health Services General Fund allocation. Um, public Health is always a head scratcher for a lot of folks. They're not quite sure what it does. People often think immunizations, emergency preparedness, both are correct. Uh, but Public Health is really um, the core foundational population-based protection and safety for our population. So we have our communicable disease unit, we have an HIV care team, this is also where we have um, vital statistics, our nurse family partnership, community health education, and our syringe services program. So some of the highlights for this coming year are that the way we've organized our budget has been with an eye towards increasing our epidemiological capacity to address communicable disease outbreaks as well as ongoing surveillance, increased emergency medical services capacity, which we have not addressed perhaps since the inception of the EMS agency, uh, transfer of substance use disorder prevention. So um, in the past, our prevention work belonged in the division where it received funding. But what we realized is that um, when you're working on population-based prevention, people benefit from doing that work together, and it's a really good fit in community health education. And so we're working on um, a transition plan now that we've shifted the funds over to include the staff in how they might better optimize their shared work, uh, working as a prevention team. Um, another big change is that all of our birth and, birth and death records, our vital records, are now online. And this is the year that we intend to apply for national public health accreditation. Uh, so I know this morning um, there is when uh, homeless services presented their budget as well. Um, they had uh, they had some work that they were doing around community education, and there were some questions about this. So we also have a operational plan objective to, by June 2020, develop a community education and outreach campaign across the issues of homelessness, mental health, and substance use disorders, as well as health equity. And this is an objective that grew over time. And the reason is that we understood that Homeless Services was uh, pursuing resources to provide much needed community education, marketing about homelessness, but it's not something um, that any one entity was able to fund ongoing. So um, we put this in here because it started out as a public health objective, but we decided that everything falls under public health. And if we're gonna do marketing, if we're gonna be, do community outreach and public education, that while we're going through the planning process of reaching out to different communities on different subjects, we may as well use our resources to support the work of our community partners, be it homeless services, HSD, um, nonprofits, or schools. So that's the, the thought process behind this objective. So moving on to Behavioral Health Services Division. Our Behavioral Health Division is the lion's share of our budget. It um, represents nearly half of the Health Services Agency budget, 
and it's supported by 62% of our general fund contribution. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, that is decisively uh, because in our behavioral health services division, we draw down a 50% federal match for every local dollar that we put into services. So by design, we try to take all of the available public dollars that we can to leverage another Medi-Cal dollar to provide community services. Um, I think I talked in the beginning of the presentation about what populations that we serve, and I think that that's probably um, one of the biggest areas of misunderstanding or mystery about our behavioral health services is who we serve. So just to emphasize again, we do serve the Medi-Cal population as well as the uninsured and underinsured. And um, we have something called criteria where you have to um, ha reach the diagnostic crit criteria to be severely mentally ill, severely emotionally disturbed. Um, and um, what we also do is we have funds called uh, Mental Health Services Act funds, and those funds really act as the glue to allow us to do much more than our direct services and act in a way that um, we strive to be responsive to the community. And so you can look at our mental health services and our substance abuse services. And as you can see, um, there's a wide complexity of services that we provide. And um, I'm not gonna get into it today, but I will guarantee you there's a complex, complex patchwork of funding that comes together to make all of this happen. So some of the behavioral health budget highlights that I'd like to share with you is, as you are all aware, Measure G has helped fund a focused intervention team pilot. This is a pilot project that the Sheriff's Office leads in partnership with HSA. And we work closely both in the field and in custody with the Sheriff's Office with the goal of moving high frequency criminal offenders into treatment. Um, another highlight that I'd like to share our, um, is our increase in services for public guardian. So our objective in this area is by June 2021, health services public guardian will increase capacity to investigate four new probate pr referrals per month. Uh, the board recently approved us as adding several positions to our public guardian. Um, prior to now, we didn't have the capacity to take probate referrals and we struggled with the LPS, LPS cases that we had. And so we're really looking forward to being able to be responsive to Santa Cruz's aging community because we know that as time goes by, our caseloads will increase. Another one of uh, behavioral health's objectives in the operational plan is around supported housing. By June 2021, Health Services Agency will increase the number of supported housing beds for homeless adults with mental illness by 20 beds from the baseline calendar year in 2018. And then finally on the substance use disorder side, we are going to strive by June 2020 to maintain utilization to substance use disorder services at 150% from the baseline calendar year of 2017, which is when we first launched the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System. So one of our smaller divisions that many people don't often hear about is our benefits division. Our benefits division has the um, Metacruz program that offers healthcare coverage for the medically indigent, but it also is the place where we organize our whole person care program. And in whole person care, as you all know, it's a pilot project grant from the state and federal government. And our deliverable has a goal <coughs> of either serving 20, 625 unique individuals or 1,000 unduplicated individuals. So year to date, we're at 90% of that goal. And some key figures for the calendar year, are that in 2018, we enrolled 205 undu unduplicated new enrollees, 56 received housing navigation services, 70% secured housing, 39 received housing supports, 18 secured, who secured housing received tenancy supports, and um, over 40, almost 50, received peer support coaching services as well as integrated behavioral health case management services. We have 18 more months of this pilot project. And finally, the Environmental Health Services Division. 
The Environmental Health Services Division it, uh, has a budget of just over $10 million, and it's supported by 6% of the Health Services Agency general fund allocation. And some of the key highlights for the work that we do in environmental health are that um, the staff is working on a groundwater sustainability study that's going to be completed by December 2020. They're now able to use the Citizen Connect application to have community members view local restaurant inspections as well as report cases of foodborne illness. And um, the local area management plan for on-site wastewater treatment systems will be completed in 2019. Um, the other thing is that this, the Environment Health Division coordinated closely with the City of Santa Cruz County Cannabis Licensing Office and County Planning to review cannabis manufacturing applications and have begun to inspect and issue hazardous material permits for cannabis inspector or cannabis manufacturers. Um, for environmental health, the operational objective we wanted to highlight was um, number 77, water <coughs> recharge. So by June 2020, health services will work with natural resources agencies to complete one additional project to capture and recharge stormwater and implement additional managed groundwater recharge projects. Today before you, we also have a 1920 supplemental budget request of almost $4 million. Um, the first item that we're asking for is uh, $2.8 million to become the Medi-Cal Administrative Activities Targeted Case Management Host County for California. And so what that means is um, counties who want to participate in leveraging federal funds for administrative activities around Medi-Cal have to participate through a host county. And they all deposit their participation fees in that host county that serves as the middleman to the State Department of Healthcare Services. So we are doing that, serving as the pass-through, and we also receive some funds to do that. Um, and, um, and we hope that it will also boost, bolster our ability to have a seat at the table with the state to help inform future policy for the benefit of Santa Cruz County residents and all of California. In the clinics, we'll, we'll be um, remodeling a medical room at the Hel Homeless Persons Health Project. We also have rollover of the Prop 56 funds, tobacco slash oral health funds um, in public health and uh, our behavioral health division, Supervisor Caput, this might make you happy. We have a new California Health Facilities Financing Grant and it's meant for mobile crisis services for children, mental health crisis services for children in the Watsonville area. The total ask that we have for our supplemental budget is $3.94 million. This slide shows a summary of our capital projects. They reflect one-time investments that we're making. Um, as you may know, the Emmeline building is just over 50 years old, and so we're investing in the HVAC system and the roof. Um, we also have the Harbor Vet building that is located near our psychiatric health facility, and um, we've set aside a considerable amount of funds for um, the exploration of that use, uh, the use of that building. For, um, for a couple of different objectives. And one is that we would like to have at least one floor of the building. We're looking at a two floor, um, two story uh, facility. And we'd like to have the bottom floor serve as a children's crisis center. And then the top floor we have a few different options for, but we know we have several needs for um, withdrawal management beds. We also have several needs for supported housing and other things. So um, I think that the, the uses will be able to be responsive to um, the many needs that we have. Um, and I do believe that you'll hear a little bit more about capital projects when, uh, is it general services will be presenting on this? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so our fiscal landscape challenges. Um, I actually don't think that we have that many challenges that are so difficult to overcome from a fiscal standpoint. We all got a great surprise when we got the re governor's budget this year. Nevertheless, we still have challenges. And um, I believe that the budget that you have before you does its due diligence to address those challenges. For a long time, uh, not just Santa Cruz County, but all California counties have struggled with core infrastructure for public health and EMS. 
and we worked hard in this budget to expand that infrastructure. Um, we also are experiencing ongoing increases in placements for um, inpatient institutes for medical disease and public guardian. And again, we expect that to increase because we have a population that's increasing in age and it's just a function of our demographics. Uh, we also have a lot of capital improvement needs, which as you see, we've um, done the planning to address. And we have a reliance on a very fragile nonprofit system of services. Um, I'm gonna move on to the fiscal landscape opportunities. One of the things that we're doing to, uh, in terms of seizing momentum and opportunities, um, and I will say this is where I most appreciate the partnership that we have from HSD, from all of our community partners, the nonprofit system, our internal staff. I feel like the way we are approaching our budget uh, for the next two year budget cycle shows great organizational courage. One of the things that we're doing is we are investing uh, making a one-time investment of public funds into community organizations and our partner departments that serve the Medi-Cal community. And the reason for this is that we have bolstered our own internal capacity to help each of these organizations and departments maximize the federal revenue that they can leverage through their Medi-Cal administrative activities, which include things like outreach, application assistance, um, monitoring services, referral, program planning and policy development. It's all things that we do every single day, but we're currently leaving federal dollars on the table, and we wanna turn that around in Santa Cruz for the benefit of the whole community. Um, some of the things that I wanted to talk about that are happening in the state is um, behavioral health and public health are finally seeing a little bit of restoration in our realignment funding. And because of the current governor's budget that's before us, we have a lot of positives for health and human services and we get to benefit from that and so do our communities. Some of the federal opportunities are that um, the ACA was not dismantled and um, that's really, really good news. And uh, the federal government, along with the state, has an effort to eliminate new HIV transmission in the state by, uh, in the federal government by 2030, and I think the state has a different date. Um, but the other great thing that's happened at the federal level is a lot of um, energy and effort around the opioid crisis. And there has been funding that we've applied for through SAMHSA, through HRSA, through other um, federal funding opportunities for complex care, addiction, and medication assisted treatment. So what are some of the strategic innovations that we're doing? I think you've heard about them all already, but I'd like to summarize them on this slide. We have really, really focused on expanding our clinic capacity. The way that we are different as a department from any other county department is that we have federally qualified health centers that serve the underserved. And what that means is that we receive a rate for providing services that more than covers our cost. And if we're smart about how we wanna serve the community in the next 10 and 20 years, what we will do is expand our clinic capacity for these kinds of health services now in good times so that when the next recession comes and people lose employer-based health care coverage and lose income and become Medi-Cal eligible, we are ready and poised to serve them. The bright side of that is that not only are we ready and poised to serve them, but we're also not going to lose funds because we're not reliant on public tax revenues for our clinic services. So our intention is to grow our safety net of clinic health services and ensure that the extra revenue that we make from that gets reinvested back along the continuum of preventive and intermediary services where we never have enough money. So um, I guess I, I talked about our changing service demands. Um, once we do this, what we're really doing is ensuring that we have a funding mechanism to focus away from treatment, 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 really expensive back-end costs, and more um, even out our investments across the continuum of care. 
Um, another thing that we're doing is we're making pretty large investments on our Medi-Cal serving partners, um, both by our Medi-Cal administrative activities efforts as well as other efforts. One of the things that I wanted to point out is that um, ever since I came here about a year ago, um, I've been talking with community partners and working with those entities that we contract with about the difficulties that nonprofits have in um, really straightforward things like foundational services, capacity, cash flow. And so some of the things that we've done this year going into our next year contracts are working with our mental health and substance use disorder providers to change the timing of the payment of all of their contracts to ensure better cash flow for them. The other thing that we're doing on the substance use disorder side is that um, when I got here, it seemed like our hands were tied in terms of our rates because the state sets our rates for us. It's true, the state sets our rates. The rate is the rate, but it's not competitive when our substance use disorder treatment providers are also getting um, private pay patients as well as commercial insurance. So one of the things that we're doing this year is we're having these kind of augmenting or set aside agreements to ensure that we, from a different source of funds, um, from our clinics donated over to the substance use disorder side that we're able to match the rates for private pay and commercial pay and that way those who can only access substance use disorder treatment services through Medi-Cal have the same amount of access as anyone with private insurance. We also feel like this will provide some financial relief for our substance use disorder contractors. So some of the issues that we're experiencing from the rapid growth and innovation that we've been undergoing recently is that we know we have a lot of work to do in workforce infrastructure, adequacy, and development. So that is gonna be one of the key areas in our inward facing strategic plan work. Um, it's actually risen to the top as one of our priority focus areas. The other thing that we know we need to do as an agency is get with the times and then get ahead of the times. And I anticipate that we will be investing just as heavily in the future, not only on our capital <coughs> projects, but other investments such as data, technology, and evaluation. <coughs> so amidst all of this, we can never lose sight of the fact that we exist through public mandates um, to provide some foundational core health services amidst all of this rapid change. So um, we must always ensure that we serve those foundational uh, core purposes first um, and not lose sight of them when we try to change and grow rapidly. As I mentioned before, a lot of how we operate is constrained by a complicated patchwork of funding and restrictions on use, but as you can see from some of the details I've shared about our budget, we have been incredibly innovative in getting around some of those constraints so that we can better serve the public. So our recommendation is that your board approve the proposed budgets of the Health Services Agency for fiscal years 19 to 21, including our supplemental materials as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Thank you so much. Are there questions? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Glad we waited until after lunch until we could actually <laughs> hear it and not think about food the entire time. Um, uh, you have a lot of heroes in, in your department um, uh, because you're, you're on the front lines of a lot of different efforts, a lot of efforts that have a lot of scrutiny by the public. Um, and so the ability of your uh, agency to authentically collaborate, which I, which I see very clearly um, under your leadership and the commitment from the staff, um, and to deal with uh, pressing public issues in a way that people feel heard, um, that we use science, and that we uh, talk about successful strategies, um, I think is, is incredibly admirable, and, and I just want to acknowledge uh, the good work that everyone does to help make that happen. It's really um, it's not easy, and uh, I, uh, I wonder sometimes why people get into those certain lines of work, because it's not, sometimes it's not fun. Um, I also want to acknowledge the leadership that you've shown um, in trying to connect uh, our community-based partners with resources 
that come from other places other than our treasury. So the MA funding is to be able to access that, that funds to, to bring $3 million into this community. While it may not be our money, it's, it's into the Santa Cruz economy, it's helping those nonprofits uh, in a way that will make a difference. Um, in terms of the services that they can provide, uh, and just the way that you've reconceived that uh, the role that the county can play to help them all access that are, is really uh, um, is really critical. And I'm wondering how many of the 58 counties act as host counties for this uh, activity. There's only one <laughs> at a time. Um, it serves as the central contracting agent on behalf of all the other counties. It also serves as the advocate on behalf of all those counties to Department of Health Care Services. Okay, so uh, so the, I, I misunderstood that. I thought that we, we were just asking as a host county for this area, but we're for the entire state of California. We, we serve in that role for the entire state of California. And who's currently doing it now? Plumas County, where I used to come from, <laughs> where I used to work. <laughs> I'm just bringing oh, now it along the Plumas with me. Plumas County supervisors are going to be on us all over again. <laughs> Never at a uh, at a county supervisors meeting since she's come here have they failed to come up to me and say you stole them. Stole oh, them I know us. exactly who that is. Yeah. They like you, and yeah. they were glad we got you. And um, and now there's another reason. Uh, the uh, the Harbor Vet Building is going to be an important asset. Uh, uh, in terms of figuring out how to best use that spot. Um, what's going to be the process to figure out about that second story um, and how we're going to use it? Um, I think a lot of it, for, well, for one thing, I think it's going to be quite some time before we actually get construction underway and the building completed. And I welcome uh, Jessica or Eric to chime in, but, you know, according to our behavioral health division, um, I think we're going to look at what our most pressing needs are at that time. So, for example, right now, we're looking for space for withdrawal management. And it's been very challenging. Um, so if we didn't find space by then, that could be the use. But it could be that over the next 18 months, we find some success. So then we'd look at our next priority area. So it's hard to say right now exactly what we would use it for. Um, and then there are also... As you know, the, the landscape changes all the time. Um, we were recently surprised by a board and care facility in the Felton area that had to close and had to do, so it really is about what happens in um, our service and our fiscal landscape. Well, I know the youth crisis stabilization piece is very well needed, and, and what do we also need? I mean, we, we send kids outside the county right now if, they're, if they have to do residential of, of some kind, is there a possibility to consider that as, as one of these options? So families don't have to go out of, out of county to visit their kids? I, I think that there's a possibility. The, the difficulty for us is who we can serve and who we get reimbursed for. So the biggest problem is if that child is privately insured, or self-pay, then it presents more challenges. Got it. Um, so that, those are, you know, speak, I've used the words constraints a lot, and I don't like to be a negative person, but um, we do, we have certain constraints in terms of who we can serve and what we can provide. And I think that there's definitely a lot of work to do to figure out how we can serve the entire community beyond the Medi-Cal population. But first things first, um, we still don't have cert the adequate services that we need for the Medi-Cal population. Sure, uh, sure, and, I, and I, I, I was unaware of what the, what the insurance makeup was for the young people that we've seen an increase of young people coming to the behavioral health center and and just the increased need for behavioral health services uh, for young people in this community we've heard a lot about that over the yeah. last we recently had a convening of um of mental health partners for youth that included Office of Education, several school districts, our nonprofits, and it's clear to all of us who um, work in these services that um, you know, mental health problems don't see income, they don't see race, they don't, right. you know, everybody is affected. But the positive thing is that we've all come together to try to figure out how we can address this problem. Yeah, no, I appreciate that effort of collaborating when the Santa Cruz City Schools came forward and said, help us. 
Um, you mentioned uh, Jessica, and I just want to recognize her for the work on accreditation. It's glad to see that we're moving now to 2019, that we're actually going to put that application in. I know that's taken a lot of work over a number of years, uh, a lot of pieces in that puzzle to put together, and so I'm glad to see that we're getting to that stage, and I just want to acknowledge you for your ongoing work, and I know you're involved with lots of different uh, pieces in, uh, in health. Uh, so you were the right person to put on that job. But uh, congratulations on Thank getting you. to that, getting closer to the final square. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, the, um, uh, I also have the pleasure of working with a number of folks in health services, some of whom are here. Uh, Jennifer Herrera, uh, is, is, she recruited me to help out with something called Vision Zero about uh, reducing or eliminated HIV transmission by 2030 in Santa Cruz County. Um, it's great working with her and her staff uh, on that, and I'm looking forward to that process. Uh, I think we're off to a good start in terms of the conversation we have with HIP. Um, uh, it's going to take some work of, with all the private providers to, to play a role in that, uh, but I just appreciate that ongoing work. And then she, she has also attended, but uh, 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 Corinne Highland. Uh, is the primary HSA representative, I would say, with our Live Oak Cradle to Career program. Uh, it's been super helpful. Um, uh, Corinne is a, just a steady support to that program. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to talk about health issues. That has been a primary issue for the parents in the program. Um, we have a great partner in the East Cliff Family Health Center, but to be able to talk about how families can maneuver within the healthcare system, um, based on their insurance status, their immigration status, the, the, the availability of services and how to advocate for those services, having someone like her in there has been really um, super helpful uh, to that, so thank you. Um, the, you talked about medically assisted treatment as being the gold standard, and I think that's, that's probably accurate. And I know with our drug Medi-Cal waiver, we have uh, been trying to increase the treatment spaces, places for uh, people here in Santa Cruz County. And I'm wondering why we don't have an operational goal uh, trying to get to treatment on demand. Uh, because, you know, that's, it seems to me that, that, that we would, our community would be best served if we, could, if we could build the capacity of our network to be able to meet that need. Um, and it seems like something that we should be shooting for. Uh, and I'm just, uh, you know, I, I didn't see that in the list of operational goals. I, I would say that we have a lot of goals and objectives that don't appear in, <laughs> in, in there. And that is one of our goals is treatment on demand. But it's also important for people to understand that the only place we provide substance use disorder treatments isn't through substance use disorder. So we have contracted providers. Sure. We, we provide MAT and many of our community partners provide MAT. Um, in many, many different settings. So MAD isn't just a health services agency effort, it's a community-wide effort. All of the health system partners have had physicians gain their X waiver to be able to prescribe across Encompass, Janus, ourselves, all the federally qualified healthcare clinics. We are all working on this as an entire community. So no matter what door you come in, whether it's a Dignity door, um, an East Cliff door, an uh, Emmeline Clinic door, or an SSP door, you're going to have access to these services and um, we'll find a way in the community to provide them with you regardless of um, your health care coverage. And I think that that's, that's really the goal um, that we should repeat over and over and over again regardless of what the service is, is that we're part of a big system. We don't own the system. We're not the only player. Um, we rely on the rest of the system to properly serve our community. No, I, I completely recognize that and completely yeah. agree with it. And I'm just, uh, what I'm thinking is the health services agency can play a role to coordinate to make sure that we get to that goal of being able to provide treatment on demand. Because we know that the issue of uh, successful treatment is directly related to how soon someone's ready for it. And if they have to wait for that space, it becomes a deciding, it could be a deciding factor into the success of, of their treatment. So um, that's what made me yeah. think about, not, not <laughs> su suggesting that you actually have to provide all those services, but uh, the play a role as a coordinator of those services. I did have a couple questions about some of the operational goals here. Uh, the clinic wait times uh, goal, I think, is a great one. And I'm wondering, doesn't the Central Coast Alliance for Health provide in financial incentives to reducing wait times for appointments? 
And is that, is that potentially a source of funding? I'm going to ask our chief of clinics or anyone from the clinics to answer that. This is Amy Peeler. She's our chief of clinics. Thank you for the question, Supervisor Leopold. Um, Central California Alliance for Health is one of our biggest supporters and really an amazing asset to our community. And they provide us incentives in a number of ways. Uh, and they do actually call um, once a year. And they call all of our clinics and they check on our wait times. And it's that has helped us to prioritize that as one of our objectives. Um, and they do provide incentives. Great. Well, I mean, I think it's great customer service. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that, uh, that the Alliance recognize that as a value to incentivize financially because that'll just help it that much easier to keep it sustainable. Absolutely. So thanks. thank you for that. On the, you mentioned the community education piece and I had brought it up earlier around, I'm talking about the homeless services and uh, <clears throat> I just wanted you to make the connection between you have two goals. One about community education around homelessness, um, uh, behavioral health or mental health, the substance use disorder and then you also have a goal about having a communication plan. And I'm wondering, are, are these two of the same pieces? Are they two different pieces? What, you know, what's? I, I think that they are layers of an effort to do two things, engage the community in the work that we do, and then better inform them, not only about the work that we do, but the services that we have available. Um, I think I can say that across all of our divisions, we could do a whole lot better job of um, providing more clear, clarity and transparency about what we do, who we serve, how we serve it. And people shouldn't have to look through a phone book, go through three or four phone calls. You know, th That's not the way for us to operate. And so I think that this was our stab at, um, we know that we have funding and scopes of work piecemealed across mental health services, across substance use disorder, across community health. So it really is how do we try to tie together some of those different scopes of work into one agency-wide objective that looks at communicating back and forth in a feedback loop with the community and everything that we do. I, th I think it's very worthwhile. It's, it's unclear to me because we don't have the, the budget line detail is not clear enough to know how much we're, we intend to spend on these two efforts yeah. and where the funding is coming from. So I would say it's not a dedicated stream of funding. So for example, we have our Mental Health Services Act plan and that plan requires that we do stakeholder engagement. There is um, a bunch of stuff in there about reducing stigma and suicide prevention and we fund a coordinator, lots of different efforts. So it's not like a brand new funding stream just for uh, stigma work or just for community. It's, it's a part of that work, but we also have the same kind of funding in other areas such as tobacco prevention and substance use disorder prevention. So our idea, and this is part of the reason why we're uh, trying to bring in prevention under one umbrella, is it shouldn't matter that the money comes from different places. It's doing the same thing for the same community from the same organization. So it's our opportunity to start taking the resources we already have, making them work together so that we're just better at what we do. Well, that, that's great, but you don't have an idea of how much would that, that, that you're thinking that might be? I would, say, um, I would say across all of our divisions from public health to substance use disorder to the Mental Health Services Act, which are the three main funding streams that fund these sorts of things, it would be at least, um, at least a half, uh, the work of a half-time equivalent of what they're already doing across those three divisions, and then other benefits that you get. So, um, I don't know, maybe $150,000, $200,000 is the in-kind support. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, and it's one of the things of connecting this operational plan to the budget and try to figure out how much we're spending, where it's coming from. Um, the, the last area I'll just talk about is environmental health. Haven't forgotten environmental health. Uh, get to work with uh, John Ricker on a number of uh, pieces. Uh, and uh, the, the groundwater goal is, is a great goal. Um, and the work that he's doing to help facilitate the sustainability plans in both the Mid-County and um, uh, the Valley is, uh, are, is really excellent. And I've seen him at work in those. And some of those groups can be great to work with, sometimes difficult to work with. So they all seem to like John. That, that's helpful to, for all of us. 
Um, I did have a health inspections uh, question. There's a goal about reducing the number of health violations by 25 percent. And it, since I don't know exactly how that's going to be done. Um, what, uh, I'm sorry, what number is that? That's uh, number 68. So uh, there's a target number of violations, and since I don't know the baseline, so I'll just assume that that's a 25 percent uh, reduction. Um, but how do we make sure that we're not doing that just by going to fewer places? Well, actually, it's the opposite. So I'm just taking a stab at this because I didn't develop this objective okay. myself. But um, what I understand is that we're because we've been understaffed, because we have some data challenges, that we haven't been able to do timely inspections. When you don't do timely inspections, people kind of think, oh, we're not going to see them for a while. We can slide by on these things. It's the timely inspections that ensure um, that your, uh, oh, it, the, that ensure, that help you reduce violations. When they're expecting that you're coming, they're kind of following the rules and everything. So when we don't have timely violations, it kind of, you know, people get a little bit lax because they're not sure that you're actually going to come at that 12 month mark. Sure. So that's my understanding of how those two things are related that we'll be able to reduce the number of violations by getting back on track and doing timely inspections. So are we adding positions or are we actually filling vacancies? Well, hopefully we're doing both. We're actually adding one position and it's not uh, directly in the consumer protection area, but the environmental health division, I don't know how many. So. In order to do the work of these inspectors and also in HAZMAT and other areas of environmental health, you have to be a registered environmental health specialist. It's been incredibly difficult for us to recruit those positions. So part of the challenges that we have in like doing the LAMP or doing other things is that we're continually understaffed across all of our environmental health uh, programs. So we are adding a uh, position in environmental health. We're enhancing one position and we're adding a full-time position and we're hoping that that's going to help kind of alleviate things. And we also hope that with the addition of our brand new director of environmental health starting July 1, who is incredibly well respected for her work across the state, um, that's also going to help in terms of um, just having leadership that lends to being a great place to work. That's very important. I have one staff member who doesn't go out to eat and they'll they take a look at what's going on. <laughs> they can the use the Citizen inspection. Connect app now to do <clears throat> restaurant inspections. So, anyway, thank you for all your work. Uh, and there's a lot you could talk about with health services because it's a, it's a beautifully complex um, uh, set of services. But thank you for everyone for their work. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, I'd be remiss if I didn't say. Um, as I told uh, our Human Services Director, Ellen uh, Timberlake, thank you for your cooperative a effort with Human Services. Um, I think the two things that match, uh, the fit these two departments are innovative and collaborative. Uh, it is, and it's really paying huge uh, positive div dividends for the people of Santa Cruz County. So I just wanted to reiterate that and thank everybody on your staff. Um, and thank you for your, uh, the leadership that you've had in outreach to your own staff about what you're trying to get accomplished and how we're going to get there. And we want your input, staff members, and letting us know how the best way to reach those goals uh, might be, what they might be. So it's, um, it's r r critically important that um, um, we have that cooperative effort continue, and I know it will because uh, I think everybody's energized by the results to, the, to date, and some have been quick, and that's not easy to get uh, to get that accomplishment on a complicated agency that's so dependent on state and federal um, changes of mind sometimes of what we might have. So you've really been keeping up on that, and I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm especially happy to see the five full-time equivalents for the Public Guardian program that it, I know our seniors commission has been requesting this for some time and uh, we'll be able to handle probate now. So that's going to be very, very positive for uh, for us. Um, and I know, so I know you're looking at the, the rates uh, we pay to uh, place uh, folks in beds in our county so that we can be more competitive with Santa Clara County. Um, and we, we just need to increase our local access to those beds for our most vulnerable populations and behavioral health in particular. So I appreciate your efforts there. 
and uh, retooling your payment system so it aligns uh, with uh, nonprofit budgeting um, and the other agencies. Um, I especially want to congratulate you on the expanding the clinics at uh, the 14 additional beds at MLI and the four at Watsonville. Um, really doing something now on that is going to be very positive. Uh, when the upcoming, everybody talks about the upcoming recession, which um, is a time when more folks are going to be on Medi-Cal and we're going to need that ser those services more than ever. And I think we're, prepar we're prepared now much better to meet that challenge when it does uh, come here. Um, I'm also uh, really pleased about the 24 full-time equivalents made possible by Measure G. And I want to thank the, uh, the voters of Santa Cruz County again for providing that because this means we're going to be able to provide uh, better services with state and federal funding to, uh, to people who are in most need of it. Um, and I really do appreciate, uh, again, the voters of Santa Cruz County helping us in that endeavor. Um, and you did touch on the, the FIT initiative, um, but could you give us a, a little more breakdown on how much those specific funding sources uh, they each provide? Uh, the, the breakdown of how much, um, the, well, the, what, what they do provide and the coordinated effort with uh, the sheriff and so forth. Um, you did touch on it, and I can't remember which slide it was, but uh, I don't know if um, you can get to that right. Sure. Well, okay. I mean, it's not super complicated. It funds three positions. Three positions, um, yeah. So we have um, three positions that work in concert. And the sheriff's office also had some positions funded. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I thought they were talking four to me. Or something. Um, and I don't know if, Eric, you want to, we have our behavioral health director, Eric Riera, here, if um, you'd like to expound on that. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if he, he wants to. <laughs> I, I think that about covers it. Um, our three positions, we have one supervisor and then two mental health clinicians um, who accompany law enforcement out in the community as part of the FIT program. So the Measure G funding that we received are for those three positions. Are there other counties that are addressing or approaching this uh, concern like we are in this cooperative effort, law enforcement, health services and so forth? Are there other examples? There are variations of, of what we're doing here in Santa Cruz County, but ours is a fairly unique program in terms of ours being an extension of our existing law enforcement liaison program, which has proven very successful and has now become a statewide model in many communities. We expanded upon that model with FIT to target a specific population of people in the community, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, um, specifically, there was a, on page 174, number seven, uh, the under the accomplishments column, we they provide per, permanent supportive housing for 12 people, and we talked a lot about homelessness and, and so forth earlier in human services. Uh, what is the per unit cost of that, and how do we fund it? Is it a specific fund, or is it uh, a general type fund that we address? You know, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. We have various um, kinds of arrangements with various uh, facilities, and um, each one has their own kinds of cost. Um, I hate to pick on you, Eric, but if you want to provide any more detail. <laughs> sure. Um, so our expansion of supported housing um, services in the community, is, as Mimi mentioned, are supported through various funding streams. So we have a partnership with the Housing Authority um, who's provided us housing vouchers for people who are being housed through behavioral health programs in the community. We have No Place Like Home, which is gonna be providing capital funds to purchase properties to expand housing in the community. We also have a new opportunity coming up um, once the governor signs the budget, um, additional funds through whole person care, um, which will also be available to expand housing for whole person care participants. We have a competitive No Place Like Home grant that we'll be submitting in the fall um, to attach to um, several housing projects in the community and those will create set aside housing units for our, our 
um, lower income, chronically homeless individuals in the community. We have MHSA, which also provides rental assistance to individuals that were housing who do not yet have access to a Section 8 certificate. Um, we also use realignment funds and um, other funding streams to leverage for federal funds to support the service provision for people who are in those different housing programs. So it's a complicated web of different sources of funds that we use to support individuals in the community. And in terms of per unit cost, it really varies by the type of program that we're placing people in. Um, one of the newer models that we're trying out in the community is a shared housing model. So we're placing several individuals within a single home and then providing in-home supports to them through our clinical staff and our partnerships with nonprofits um, that we're working with. And that's turned out to be a very efficient way to house um, larger numbers of people at once. And we also have the opportunity to build community within those shared housing programs. So that's a model that we're looking to expand with no place like home funds in the future. Well, that's an example of your complex uh, <laughs> yeah. criteria that you have to meet to fit yeah. particular needs, but congratulations on uh, reaching out or addressing each, uh, or looking into each one of those to uh, accomplish uh, something in the end. That's really fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, um, I also would like to add that um, we have the Santa Margarita uh, Groundwater Management Agency um, in the the Upper Valley and part of Santa Cruz as well, which has, of course, Loch Lomond. But uh, the, the efforts of John Ricker and that has just been fa fantastic. We're moving along and have that 2022 date. I know SoCal has 2020, and it's going to be upon us, upon them uh, before we know it. But uh, that is something that, uh, of course, was state driven. Uh, and mandated, but uh, it's something that's going to be really a good thing for um, predict predictability and um, it's something that we need to look forward to how we're going to provide that invaluable resource to the people of the county. And, but John Ricker has just been fantastic in, in each of those uh, settings, I know. Uh, one last question. The uh, National Health Accreditation, uh, do you know when you're going to know when Will it be by the end of this year, or did you, did you, do they just say, submit it, and we'll let you know later? It's an incredibly complex process. <laughs> we submit our application, and then within two to three months of submitting the application, we'll find out if the initial application is approved or not. Um, from that time, we go to an orientation, and we have 12 months to submit our documentation. Typically, uh, public health agencies uh, submit 800 or so documents to support public health accreditation. I, I have served as a site reviewer for the Public Health Accreditation Board, so I'm really intimately familiar with this process. After, after that year of submitting your documentation, um, once the Public Health Accreditation Board says that everything's complete, you'll probably get a site visit in another three to four months, sometimes six, depending on how many of us are volunteering to be site visitors. Um, and then maybe by in year two, towards the end of year two, you'll find out if you're accredited. It's very long. Oh, you think it was long up to here. Yeah, right. <laughs> we still have a couple so more So it's go. probably going to be at least 2021 before we... Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And thank you again for your work. Appreciate it. Sylvester Cabot. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was asked earlier when the human services uh, portion was uh, up, the percentage of homeless people Maybe your uh, division would uh, know uh, the, the homeless popula population, how much, uh, what percentage, great percentage, I believe, would have drug addiction and mental health problems yeah. and or. I don't know that answer off the top of my head. I know that we are going to get more detailed information from the ASR point in time count. I will say that um, this past winter, our homeless persons health project staff went and did a, um, a survey of those folks who were at the gateway encampment. And they surveyed about 100 people who were there. At that time, there were about 130 residents. 
and if memory serves me correctly, about 40-plus um, percent of them self-reported having a substance use disorder. About 60-plus percent of them reported having a mental health disorder. I can't recall the overlap between those two, but what's clear is that people who are homeless are also um, impacted by substance use disorder and mental health issues. We shared that data, actually Rainy Marr shared that data that we collected with ASR that does the annual whole county count for us. And they said that the data that we had collected from that population was pretty representative of what they experience annually for Santa Cruz County. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would assume, I'm just, uh, when you get the, a lot of these problems mixed together, it's very difficult to actually get someone off the street that's homeless and actually get them independently on their own. Yeah, so. I would say that the key is um, interact in as many settings as you can and usually in their setting. And I just wanna give a shout out to all of our staff that are here today because it's their work that resulted in our operational objectives as well as this budget, but particularly the Homeless Persons Health Project because they are in the field dealing with our folks um, who are homeless. They provide field medical services two to three days a week. They're often out in the field finding people bringing them to the emergency room, following their wound care, um, giving them immunizations, and um, it would be really hard for us to engage with the homeless population and their needs without that team. Yeah. And uh, thanks a lot for all your help with the mental health uh, advisory board and getting uh, uh, someone to take minutes and also you know, keep that going. Uh, it's a very important uh, commission that we do have. And I guess one question I ask, uh, every month and uh, it's uh, no fault of our own. It's uh, usually, uh, right now PG&E has been the big delay. Opening up the new facility in Watsonville, uh, when, it, when we were told back in November or something, it looked like it was gonna be open within a month. Then I started telling people it'll be about two months to give myself a little lay, leeway. But uh, is, is it pretty close right now? <laughs> it's really or is, close. Is, is there another? Answer. I know there's always a hang up. Yeah, it's very close. Um, we've settled our issues with PG&E, so the building has power, gas, internet service yeah. now. Um, landscaping's being done in the front of the building, in the rear of the building. And we're just waiting for a fire inspection to be scheduled. And once that fire inspection is complete, then we have to have a State Department of Healthcare Services review of the building so that it can be certified to provide medic health services to our residents. Once that's done, we'll be ready to move in. And the parking lot, parking lot's ready and, uh, you know, um, parking, we have what we've done in the in the rear part of the lot at 1430 is we've striped um, the existing pavement back there for parking until a decision can be made in terms of a more permanent parking solution. You bet. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, we're looking forward to it. And, uh, I know it's... Uh, out of our hands sometimes what we can get done. I know PG&E has had their own problems and uh, hopefully uh, they can finish it up and we'll get the inspection. Yeah, absolutely, and we look forward to having all of you to an open house so that we can show off our new facility. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation. I think it's, um, the amount of uh, increased capacity and stabilizing revenue and increased quality that has been uh, increased in your department over the past couple of years is really remarkable and it's a testament to the hard work of people in the room. Um, and you know, every increased capacity is people's lives that we're improving or saving. And so I uh, just wanna thank you for all your work. I just have a couple uh, smaller questions. So one is I hadn't realized until the, um, presentation about how in-depth this strategic plan uh, process is within your department, and I think it's great to align, and certainly as you talked about, it's, it's all, we're serving all the same people, and so to align across the agency is so important. How will this interact with the operational goals that are gonna be adopted on Tuesday? Because it seems like those are a lot of goals, they're very ambitious, 
And so are you going to be adding additional goals or are these just sort of the key steps to get to those goals? Like what's the, what's the difference between the two and how, what's the role? You know? Sure. I, I would say the main difference between the two is um, the county strategic plan is both inward and outward facing. There are a lot of goals to improve the health of the community, to change something in the environment. Um, our plan is going to be inward facing at our own operational, financial, infrastructure, personnel, workforce development, things that we haven't, um, we haven't been able to focus on for a long time to ensure that we're in the best place to achieve our operational goals. Because that work has yet to be done, it's happening in the next six months, what I imagine is we're going to have a departmental strategic plan that's mainly organizational and that um, the our own objectives that we choose for ourselves, either agency-wide or across all of the divisions, will appear in the next iteration of the operational plan. Great. Um, I'm glad you're doing that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, second question is, so the detox beds, which Supervisor Leopold mentioned, uh, and you mentioned, you know, they're just such a critical need and they're kind of a bottleneck. Uh, <clears throat> and we've heard several different options. When can we get a report on what the options are, what the relative cost per bed is, and when the timeline is, because obviously the faster you go in general, the more we'll have to pay, but that may be worth it um, to alleviate a need and to create a bigger pipeline for some of our other programs. So what's the, uh, uh, we have a sense that there, we're heading in a direction, but when do we get the roadmap with dates and times and costs? Um, I think, well, there's, a two full, there's kind of like a two-pronged approach to withdrawal management. From my understanding, and Shana isn't here, she's our uh, direct alcohol and drug administrator over substance use disorder services, but you received a report on the drug medical services not long ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you might have noticed in that report is that the utilization of withdrawal management beds is far below projection. And so when I dug in deeper with that uh, program about why <coughs> that is, um, Part of it was because even the beds that we have available to us that we've contracted for are not being utilized because that contractor can get a better rate. So if they have, let's say they have 20 beds and um, all 20, you know, they know that they're gonna get a private paying or commercial pay patient, then um, they might not be motivated to accept our patient. So one way to address that specific situation is exactly what we're doing right now, is we're exploring a way to enhance the state rate that we get, similar to what we do for residential beds on the mental health side, and we're using our funds that actually are overage funds transferred from the clinic so that we can match rates or have some kind of side agreement to guarantee the beds we're already contracting for are actually utilized. As far as the other one, um, I can't tell you what the timeline is because we only have maybe two good options. One is to look for a contractor or a facility that's out of county and that's actually not really a good option for me. Um, but the other option is um, find an operator to expand services here. The barrier to that is space. And so we were talking about the Harbor Vet building. The, the second floor of that facility is a potential space. Um, it, withdrawal management has a medical component to it and um, it's highly overseen. So there's a potential that we could add if we didn't find another place by the time that, that building was done, that t 10 of those, there would be 10 beds available for withdrawal management. Getting an operator isn't the hard part, it's finding a building. And so I think that we could find someone to provide the services for us. The trick is where do we find a place that accommodates 10, 15, 16, 20 beds? So that, that'll, and it kind of looks like we have to create it ourselves. So if we don't find a place before, you know, the 18 or 24 months that the Harbor Vet building gets done, um, that's a potential for it. Right, so. Um, I didn't really answer your question, did I? Right, so I guess I'm trying to see, because I think the goal, if I remember correctly, the operational goal was to get, to double the number of beds it's a relatively small number, but doubling is, is important by 2021. And I'm trying to get a sense, is this something that's gonna happen in 2021 or is this something that's gonna happen in 2020? Like what's yeah. the, and it, are there interim steps we can take 
at at what cost? I'm just trying to get a sense as to like, is this right? Are, so, are we really so work? Are, is the expectation really going to be that? May of 2021, these beds come online, or is it really expectation? I don't think so. Our staff okay. are so I already named one interim step, which is increasing our local capacity capacity to use the beds that are available already. Um, the second interim, our staff have been working really, really hard to explore potential contracts with uh, facil with facilities operators. Again, not all of them are in county. Um, so, I mean, I think that. So much is unpredictable, but I, I think that in a year's time, we would, de well, in less than a year's time, we'll definitely make progress because of our contractual arrangements that we're working on with our existing provider. Um, but in a year's time, we might know a little bit more about if we're gonna have to contract with an outside entity outside the county, or if we have um, something really well in, you know, greased in the pipes for in-county. It'd be great if we could get a, a, a date at which we could have a report to have us to know what the the timeline and potential options are and when when we can expect those beds to come online second one is perhaps we could include that when we come with our regular reports for the drug medical organized delivery system yeah yeah that'd, that'd be great yeah. that would be that'd be that'd be really helpful um the second question is the children's mental health crisis beds are obviously a huge need in this community our adjacent counties are both expanding their options which uh, while well, outside of county are much better than the current options, which are far outside of our county, um, or or the emergency room, our local emergency rooms. Have we had any? Have we made any progress with either Santa Clara or Monterey County in terms of being able to have access to some of those beds for our kids? Yeah, I know that we've had um, preliminary communications, and I believe Eric either either did a site visit or had a meeting with Santa Clara County. And so we are exploring partnerships to see how we can collaborate to increase access for us, uh, for our kids here in Santa Cruz County. Okay. And I believe you put us in touch with the Santa Clara County folks. So okay. thank you, yeah. Great, I think it's, um, there's just such a need and um, I don't think, I don't know that we'll be able to provide enough locally, uh, or I know we won't. Um, and so is there an opportunity to partner going forward? Okay. Um, Seeing anyone else, is there any member of the public who would like to speak to us today? Only one? All right, yeah. So again, I appreciate all that's being done. It's a lot of hard work, obviously, but um, again, uh, regarding the second story program, um, a complete debacle in its implementation. Uh, I've been in front of you now many times providing evidence of in, I allege criminal activity um, and things that go up to the state and even on a federal level. I, I hear a lot of these things, integrity, equity and justice, building compa capacity, uh, operational excellence, um, the word authentic was used. Um, and, and doing what you are doing requires all of that, requires truth and um, transparency um, in order to get accredited, in order to do all these things. Yet right in front of you is something that, um, it, in my opinion, spoils everything. I hear the words, you speak them, and then it just kind of floats away. Because I'm telling you, and I've told you over and over again for two years now, that what occurred was absolutely wrong, illegal, um, and nobody is stepping up to take care of it. Uh, the board here says they can't touch it now, it's out of their hands, and I don't believe that. I believe that um, Encompass, I've heard from a good source, too big to fail, um, and that is not a good position to be in because if we keep going down this path, they are going to fail. And so you, you can't, you just can't do that. So I'm requesting that you defund Encompass or at least Second Story to the point where you can then get them to acknowledge what has occurred, get them to move out of the program, out of that property because it's just improper all the way through. Thank you. Thank you. That closes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. So I'm just gonna ask for just a point of clarification on, on that point, which is 
Do you have a sense of what we continue to fund the second story program in through secondary pots, um, recognizing that obviously the building was purchased on things outside of our control recently, but do you have any understanding of any sort of programmatic funding that still continues to go from the county to second story? I don't know the detail of that for 1920. I know that for this current year, um, we did not provide any funding because they had a, uh, a donor that was able to provide funds for both the building and the operational services. I don't know how long those funds last. I don't know if you can answer that question, Eric. As part of the MHSA plan that was submitted to the state, we did um, put in, based on the community input that we received, I think approximately $270,000 for 1920 to help support the second story program in their contract. And that's about the, what we estimated the yearly uh, operational cost to be, correct? It's about, it's a little less than half. Can you quickly explain how the MHSA funding is allocated? I mean, it, it's not exclusively a county process. I mean, who are members Correct. of the organization? Yeah. It's, it's based on an extensive community stakeholder process. And so we held several stakeholder meetings, and that was one of the number one funding priorities that was identified by the people participating. So we built that into our MHSA plan, which we submitted in December um, to the state. And what flexibility does the county have to alter that plan once it goes through that state process, in essence, not meaning the state MHSA community stakeholder process? We would have to go through another community stakeholder process because that's part of determining what we use those MHSA funds for. And so we do that annually. I guess, uh, all right, so, so the flexibility, if that, organ, if that group of people, which includes the representatives of NAMI and others, if they came back with a funding recommendation, how much flexibility does the county have to not accept their funding recommendation is what I meant. Um, I think that would put us in poor standing with the state because they have a very close um, focus and priority on what the community is asking for in terms of where we direct that MHSA funds. So in essence, whatever that or whatever the group of stakeholders comes up with, we just in essence pass through as a recommendation for MHSA funding to the state? It's not quite that simple, um, but I think if we were to go against what the community was recommending, um, that would go back to the Mental Health Oversight and Accountability Commission and we would have to be able to respond and defend that decision. So for all intents and purposes, then we do just sort of just pass through what those recommendations are. What I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to explain for the community about how that process works. We strongly consider, yes, the recommendations of the community. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, to be clear, um, on the agenda, it didn't list the operational plan, but on, on the information in front of us, the operational plan is on there. We are voting on the operational plan today. Uh, you you are, but the final adoption will be on next Tuesday. So there's okay. still an opportunity um, by next Tuesday if you wanted to make further changes. But yeah, you I'm, are I'm, today voting. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not looking to make any changes. But the yeah. other departments had the operational plans listed on the agenda, and this one wasn't. And I wasn't exactly sure why that was. Maybe it was just left off by an error. I think it was so just clear. So I, I would move the recommendations for all the pieces, the proposed budget, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the unified fee schedule, the continuing agreements list, the errata, and the operational plan. So we got a motion. We got a motion by Leopold, the second by McPherson. I'd ask that um, we add the additional direction that uh, at the next report on drug Medi-Cal, we get a, a sense of, of Timeline and cost for expanding detox and withdrawal management services. It is a friendly amendment. <laughs> All right. Friendly with you, Mr. Second. All right. Uh, motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you and thank you to the HSA team for your good work. Thank you to all of you. You guys have helped put all this together. Thanks.
So we are gonna recess until our 7 p.m. Uh, evening session tonight. That evening session is a uh, continued public hearing on the proposed budget and it's an opportunity for members of the public to come to speak to us about uh, any aspect of the budget that they wish to engage us on. Because community needs. Has anybody unlocked the front door? <laughs> Don't shank that kid. Uh -huh. Were you putting in the frozen? Well, food? last year, maybe. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call our meeting back to order. Uh, and this is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about uh, our budget in general. A, we're holding a public hearing on the 2019-2021 proposed county budget. Uh, and um, we're going to offer an opportunity for public comment. 
there is no uh, one in the audience to provide that public comment, I'm going to ask the CEO to provide a very brief overview of our um, of our budget. And I encourage those who are interested. The entire budget is online, as well as uh, a more in-depth summary that uh, the CAO offered both on the first budget day and last night in Watsonville. And if you're interested, you can access both those on our website. Mr. Palacios, do you want to give us a quick overview for viewers who might be joining us from home? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Coonerty and members of the board, uh, we have started our budget hearings uh, this past Monday, and we are continuing uh, throughout the week through Thursday uh, morning. We had an evening session uh, last night in Watsonville, and tonight we're in Santa Cruz. Uh, as the board chair mentioned, I gave uh, an overview of the budget both in our first day on Monday and on um, Monday night in Watsonville. So I'll just give a very brief um, summary of this. So um, I wanted to point out our work plan, which is that we have a strategic plan, which is a six year uh, document that was adopted last year. It has uh, six uh, focus areas and each focus area has four goals. So there's a total of 24 uh, goals that are laid out by policy area. Uh, this year we will be adopting a two-year operational plan and a two-year budget. Uh, these are the first time the county is, is um, adopting this method. Um, the basic premise is that the operation plan links the strategic plan goals to the actual funding decisions made in the two-year budget. Uh, this is our first year. We hope to get better at it. Uh, there are 72, op 172 um, objectives in the operation plan, soon to increase to 178. And uh, in the following year, we will be doing performance evaluation as well as continuous process improvement. Uh, this is um, a plan where there will be three um, operational plans, three two-year budgets within this uh, cycle. I'll just go through um, I'll go through the fiscal stewardship that the board has showed. Um, over the last number of years, we have tripled our reserves. Um, we are now at the board's uh, directed goal of 10% of revenues. We've improved our credit rating. Um, We've reduced pension obligations. Um, we have controlled our employee growth, having less employees today than we did um, before the Great Recession in 2009, even though we've greatly expanded services and we're making progress in addressing deferred maintenance. So I'm gonna go very quickly through these uh, budget overviews uh, because we've already spoken about these um, twice, but I wanted to just get to um, this part right here, which is um, the 2021 uh, budget. So what this shows is that uh, the current year, uh, fiscal year 1819, has been balanced. We had a we anticipate having 6.2 million dollars um, of fund balance at the end of this year. Uh, next year, which is 1920, we also have a balanced budget. And so the board will be adopting a balanced budget um, at the end in the next week, next Tuesday. And we anticipate having also about $6.2 million of fund balance. Uh, but in 2021, which is the out year, this is the second year of the two-year budget, we are projecting a uh, $6.4 million, $6 million deficit. So that's above uh, the anticipated um, Fund balance is 6.2. On top of that, we would have to either get more revenue or make cuts of $6.4 million. So that is the concern is in the out year. And this, this chart shows the deficits um, were balanced in 20 and then 2021. 20, uh, we have a best case scenario of deficit of about 6.4 6 million, but it could be um, as high as 12 to $13 million if we were in a recessionary environment. This shows you our reserves, which are very healthy, which is good for us in terms of our fiscal stewardness, stewardship. Um, I'll just say that our, in summary, that our challenges are that in the out year, our costs are rising faster than our revenues. 
We worry about approaching recession. Uh, we also worry about the housing shortage uh, in the, the community, which is affecting the entire state. And we also worry about the damage from the 2016-17 storm, winter storms, which caused a great deal of damage to our roads. Those are our biggest concerns. In any event, that concludes my pre presentation, and I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, and again, a longer version. The entire budget is available online for anyone who wants to access it, uh, and a longer version, if people wanna watch, is available at both the Monday uh, morning hearings and the Monday evening hearings. With that, we will uh, continue our um, uh, recess to continue our budget hearings, which will begin at 9 a.m. tomorrow, Wednesday, June 19th, here at the uh, 701 Ocean Street at the Governmental Center on the fifth floor. And uh, tomorrow we'll be uh, planning and public works. Thank you very much.